Chapter 21 He had tried. When the blood-soaked woman had spoken to him, when those turquoise eyes had seemed so familiar, he had tried to wrest away control of his body, his tongue, but the demon prince in him had held him firm, delighting in his struggle. He had sobbed with relief when she trapped it and raised an ancient blade over his head. Then she had hesitated, and that other woman had fired an arrow and she put down the sword and left, left him still trapped with the demon. He could not remember her name, refused to remember her name, even as the man on the throne questioned him about the incident, even as he returned to the exact spot in the garden and prodded the discarded shackles lying in the gravel. She had left him, and with good reason. The demon prince had wanted to feed on her, and then hand her over, but he wished she had killed him. He hated her for not killing him. Chapter 22 Kao left his watch on the roof of Aelin's apartment the moment the hooded head of one of the rebels appeared and signaled that he would take over. Thank the gods. He didn't bother stopping in the apartment to see how Aiden was holding up. Each of his pounding steps on the wooden stairs accented the raging, thunderous beat of his heart until it was all he could hear, all he could feel. With the other rebels lying low or monitoring the city, and Nezrin gone to make sure her father wasn't in danger, Kaol found himself alone as he stalked through the city streets. Everyone had their orders. Everyone was where they were supposed to be. Nezrin had already told him Ress and Brulo had given her the signal that all was clear on their end. And now? Liar. Aelin was and had always been a god's damned liar. She was as much an oathbreaker as he was. Worse. Dorian wasn't gone. He wasn't. And he didn't give a shit how much Aelin trumpeted about mercy for Dorian or that she said it was a weakness not to kill him. The weakness lay in his death. That's what he should have said. The weakness lay in giving up. He stormed down an alley. He should have been hiding as well, but the roaring in his blood and bones was unrelenting. A sewer grate rang beneath his feet. He paused and peered into the blackness below. There were still things to do, so many things to do, so many people to keep from harm. And now that Aelin had yet again humiliated the king, he had no doubt the Valg would round up more people as punishment, as a statement. With the city still in uproar, perhaps it was the perfect time for him to strike, to even the odds between them. No one saw as he climbed into the sewer, closing the lid overhead. Tunnel after tunnel, his sword gleaming in the afternoon light streaming through the grates, Kaol hunted those valg pieces of filth, his steps near silent. They usually kept to their nests of darkness, but every now and then, stragglers prowled the tunnels. Some of their nests were small, only three or four of them guarding their prisoners, or meals, he supposed, easy enough for him to ambush. And wouldn't it be wonderful to see those demon heads roll? Gone. Dorian is gone. Aelin didn't know everything. Fire or beheading couldn't be the only choices. Maybe he would keep one of the Valg commanders alive, see just how far gone the man inside the demon truly was. Maybe there was another way. There had to be another way. Tunnel after tunnel after tunnel. All the usual haunts, and no sign of them. Not one. Kaol hurried into a near run as he headed for the largest nest he knew of, where they'd always been able to find civilians in need of rescuing, if they were lucky enough to catch the guards unawares. He would save them, because they deserved it, and because he had to keep at it, or else he would crumble and... Kaol stared at the gaping mouth of the main nest. Watery sunlight filtering in from above illuminated the grey stones and the little river at the bottom. No sign of the telltale darkness that usually smothered it like a dense fog. Empty. The Valg soldiers had vanished and taken their prisoners with them. He didn't think they'd gone into hiding from fear. They'd moved on, concealing themselves and their prisoners as a giant laughing go to hell to every rebel who actually thought they were winning this secret war. To Kaol. He should have thought of pitfalls like this, should have considered what might happen when Aelin Galathinius made a fool of the king and his men. He should have considered the cost. Maybe he was the fool. There was a numbness in his blood as he emerged from the sewers onto a quiet street. It was the thought of sitting in his ramshackle apartment, utterly alone with that numbness, that sent him southward, trying to avoid the streets that still steamed with panicked people. Everyone demanded to know what had happened, who had been killed, who had done it. The decorations and baubles and food vendors had been entirely forgotten. The sounds eventually died away, the streets clearing out as he reached a residential district where the homes were of modest size but elegant, well-kept. Little streams and fountains of water from the Avery flowed throughout, lending themselves to the surplus of blooming spring flowers at every gate, window sill, and tiny lawn. He knew the house from the smell alone. Fresh-baked bread, cinnamon, and some other spice he couldn't name. Taking the alley between the two pale stone houses, he kept to the shadows as he approached the back door, peering through the pane of glass to the kitchen within. 
flower-coated a large work table, along with baking sheets, various mixing bowls, and... The door swung open, and Nezrin's slim form filled the entryway. What are you doing here? She was back in her guard's uniform, a knife tucked behind her thigh. She'd no doubt spotted an intruder approaching her father's house and readied herself. Kael tried to ignore the weight pushing down on his back, threatening to snap him in two. Aiden was free. they accomplished that much. But how many other innocents had they doomed today? Nezrin didn't wait for his reply before she said, Come in. The guards came and went. My father sent them on their way with pastries. Kael glanced up from his own pear tart and scanned the kitchen. Bright tiles accented the walls behind the counters in pretty shades of blue, orange, and turquoise. He'd never been to Sayed Felique's house before, but he'd known where it was, just in case. He'd never let himself consider what that just-in-case might entail. Showing up like a stray dog at the back door hadn't been it. They didn't suspect him? No, they just wanted to know whether he or his workers saw anyone who looked suspicious before Aiden's rescue. Nezrin pushed another pastry, this one almond and sugar, toward him. Is the general all right? As far as I know. He told her about the tunnels, the Valg. Nezrin only said, so we'll find them again, tomorrow. He waited for her to pace, to shout and swear, but she remained steady, calm, some tight part of him uncoiled. She tapped a finger on the wooden table, lovingly worn as if the kneading of a thousand loaves of bread had smoothed it out. Why did you come here? For distraction. There was a suspicious gleam in those midnight eyes of hers, enough so that he said, Not for that. She didn't even blush, though his own cheeks burned. If she had offered, he probably would have said yes, and hated himself for it. You're welcome here, she said, but surely your friends at the apartment, the general at least, would provide better company. Are they, my friends? You and Her Majesty have done a great job trying to be anything but. It's hard to be friends without trust. You are the one who went to Arabin again, even after she warned you not to. And he was right, Kale said. He said she would promise not to touch Dorian, and then do the opposite. And he would be forever grateful for the warning shot Nezrin had fired. Nezrin shook her head, her dark hair glimmering. Let's just imagine that Aelin is right, that Dorian is gone. What then? She's not right. Let's just imagine. He slammed his fist on the table hard enough to rattle the glasses of water. She's not right. Nezrin pursed her lips, even as her eyes softened. Why? He scrubbed at his face. Because then it's all for nothing. Everything that happened, it's all for nothing. You wouldn't understand. I wouldn't? A cold question. You think that I don't understand what's at stake? I don't care about your prince, not the way you do. I care about what he represents for the future of this kingdom, and for the future of people like my family. I won't allow another immigrant purge to happen. I don't ever want my sister's children coming home with broken noses again because of their foreign blood. You told me Dorian would fix the world, make it better. But if he's gone, if we made the mistake today in keeping him alive, then I will find another way to attain that future. And another one after that, if I have to. I will keep getting back up, no matter how many times those butchers shove me down. He'd never heard so many words from her all at once. Had never, never even known she had a sister, or that she was an aunt. Nezrin said, stop feeling sorry for yourself. Stay the course, but also plot another one. Adapt. His mouth had gone dry. Were you ever hurt for your heritage? Nezrin glanced toward the roaring hearth, her face like ice. I became a city guard because not a single one of them came to my aid the day that the other school children surrounded me with stones in their hands. Not one, even though they could hear my screaming. She met his stare again. Dorian Havilliard offers a better future, but that responsibility also lies with us, with how common people choose to act. True. So true, Buddy said. I won't abandon him, she sighed. You're even more hard-headed than the queen. Would you expect me to be anything else? A half-smile. I don't think I would like you if you were anything but a stubborn ass. You actually admit to liking me? Did last summer not tell you enough? Despite himself, K.O. laughed. Tomorrow, Nezrin said. Tomorrow we continue on. He swallowed. Stay the course, but plot a new path. He could do that. He could try it, at least. See you in the sewers, bright and early. Chapter 23 Aiden rose to consciousness and took in every detail that he could without opening his eyes. A briny breeze from a nearby open window tickled his face. Fishermen were shouting their catches a few blocks away, and, and someone was breathing evenly, deeply nearby, sleeping. 
He opened an eye to find that he was in a small wood-paneled room decorated with care and a penchant for the luxurious. He knew this room, knew this apartment. The door across from his bed was open, revealing the great room beyond, clean and empty and bathed in sunshine. The sheets he slept between were crisp and silken, the pillows plush, the mattress impossibly soft. Exhaustion coated his bones, and pain splintered through his side, but dully. And his head was infinitely clearer as he looked toward the source of that even deep breathing and beheld the woman asleep in the cream-colored armchair beside the bed. Her long, bare legs were sprawled over one of the rolled arms, scars of every shape and size adorning them. She rested her head against the wing, her shoulder-length golden hair, the end stained a reddish-brown, as if a cheap dye had roughly washed out, strewn across her face. Her mouth was slightly open as she dozed, comfortable in an oversized white shirt and what looked to be a pair of men's undershorts. Safe. Alive. For a moment, he couldn't breathe. Aelin. He mouthed her name. As if she heard it, she opened her eyes, coming fully alert as she scanned the doorway, the room beyond, then the bedroom itself for any danger. And finally, finally she looked at him and went utterly still, even as her hair shifted in the gentle breeze. The pillow beneath his face had become damp. She just stretched out her legs like a cat and said, I'm ready to accept your thanks for my spectacular rescue at any time, you know. He couldn't stop the tears leaking down his face, even as he rasped, remind me to never get on your bad side. A smile tugged at her lips, and her eyes, their eyes, sparkled. Hello, Aiden. Hearing his name on her tongue snapped something loose, and he had to close his eyes, his body barking in pain as it shook with the force of the tears trying to get out of him. When he'd mastered himself, he said hoarsely, Thank you for your spectacular rescue. Let's never do it again. She snorted, her eyes lined with silver. You're exactly the way I dreamed you'd be. Something in her smile told him that she already knew that Ren or Kaol had told her about him, about being a Darlin's whore, about the Bane. So all he could say was, You're a little taller than I'd imagine, but no one's perfect. It's a miracle the king managed to resist executing you until yesterday. Tell me he's in a rage the likes of which has never been seen before. If you listen hard enough, you can actually hear him shrieking from the palace. Aiden laughed, and it made his wound ache. But the laugh died as he looked her over from head to toe. I'm going to throttle Ren and the captain for letting you save me alone. And here we go. She looked at the ceiling and sighed loudly. A minute of pleasant conversation, and then the territorial fae bullshit comes raging out. I waited an extra 30 seconds. Her mouth quirked to the side. I honestly thought you'd last 10. He laughed again and realized that though he'd loved her before, he'd merely loved the memory, the princess taken away from him. But the woman, the queen, the last shred of family he had. It was worth it, he said, his smile fading. You were worth it. All these years, all the waiting... You're worth it. He'd known the moment she had looked up at him as she stood before his execution block, defiant and wicked and wild. I think that's the healing tonic talking, she said, but her throat bobbed as she wiped her tears. She lowered her feet to the floor. Kaol said you're even meaner than I am most of the time. Kaol is already on his way to being throttled and you're not helping. She gave him that half smile again. Ren's in the north. I didn't get to see him before Kale convinced him to go there for his own safety. Good, he managed to say, and patted the bed beside him. Someone had stuffed him into a clean shirt, so he was decent enough, but he managed to haul himself away into a sitting position. Come here. She glanced at the bed, at his hand, and he wondered whether he'd crossed some line, assumed some bond between them that no longer existed, until her shoulders slumped and she uncoiled from the chair in a smooth, feline motion before plopping down on the mattress. Her scent hit him. For a second, he could only breathe it deep into his lungs, his fey instincts roaring that this was family, this was his queen, this was Aelin. He would have known her even if he were blind. Even if there was another scent entwined with hers. Staggeringly powerful and ancient and male. Interesting. She plumped up the pillows and he wondered if she knew how much it meant to him, as a demi fey male, to have her lean over to straighten his blankets too, then run a sharp, critical eye down his face to fuss over him. He stared right back, scanning for any wounds, any sign that the blood on her the other day hadn't belonged only to those men. But save for a few shallow scabbed cuts on her left forearm, she was unharmed. When she seemed assured that he wasn't about to die, and when he was assured the wounds on her arm weren't infected, she leaned back on the pillows and folded her hands over her abdomen. Do you want to go first, or should I? Outside, the gulls were crying to each other, and that soft briny breeze kissed his face. You, he whispered. 
Tell me everything. So she did. They talked and talked until Aiden's voice became hoarse, and then Aelin bullied him into drinking a glass of water. And then she decided that he was looking peaky, so she padded to the kitchen and dug up some beef broth and bread. Lysandra, Kael, and Nezrin were nowhere to be seen, so they had the apartment to themselves. Good, Aelin didn't feel like sharing her cousin right now. As Aiden devoured his food, he told her the unabridged truth of what had happened to him these past ten years, just as she'd done for him. And when they were both finished telling their stories, when their souls were drained and grieving, but gilded with growing joy, she nestled down across from Aiden, her cousin, her friend. They'd been forged of the same ore, two sides of the same golden, scarred coin. She'd known it when she spied him atop the execution platform. She couldn't explain it. No one could understand that instant bond, that soul-deep assurance and rightness, unless they, too, had experienced it. But she owed no explanations to anyone, not about Aiden. They were still sprawled on the bed, the sun now setting into late afternoon, and Aiden was just staring at her, blinking, as if he couldn't quite believe it. Are you ashamed of what I've done? She dared to ask. His brow creased. Why would you ever think that? She couldn't quite look at him in the eye as she ran a finger down her blanket. Are you? Aiden was silent long enough that she lifted her head, but found him gazing toward the door, as though he could see through it, across the city, to the captain. When he turned to her, his handsome face was open, soft in a way she doubted many ever saw. Never, he said. I could never be ashamed of you. She doubted that, and when she twisted away, he gently grabbed her chin, forcing her eyes to him. You survived. I survived. We're together again. I once begged the gods to let me see you, if only for a moment, to see you and know you'd made it, just once. That's all I ever hoped for. She couldn't stop the tears that began slipping down her face. Whatever you had to do to survive, whatever you did from spite or rage or selfishness, I don't give a damn. You're here, and you're perfect. You always were, and you always will be. She hadn't realized how much she needed to hear that. She flung her arms around him, careful of his injuries, and squeezed him as tightly as she dared. He wrapped an arm around her, the other bracing them, and buried his face in her neck. I missed you, she whispered onto him, breathing in his scent, that male warrior's scent she was just learning, remembering. Every day, I missed you. Her skin grew damp beneath his face. Never again, he promised. It was honestly no surprise that after Aelin trashed the vaults, a new warren of sin and debauchery had immediately sprung up in the slums. The owners weren't even trying to pretend it wasn't a complete imitation of the original, not with a name like the Pits. But while its predecessor had at least provided a tavern-like atmosphere, the Pits didn't bother. In an underground chamber, hewn from the rough stone, you paid for your alcohol with your cover charge, and if you wanted to drink, you had to brave the casks in the back and serve yourself. Aelin found herself somewhat inclined to like the owners. They operated by a different set of rules. But some things remained the same. The floors were slick and reeking of ale and piss and worse, but Aelin had anticipated that. What she hadn't expected, exactly, was the deafening noise. The rock walls and close quarters magnified the wild cheers from the fighting pits, the place that had been named after, where onlookers were betting on the brawls within. Brawls like the one she was about to participate in. Beside her, Kale, cloaked and masked, shifted on his feet. This is a terrible idea, he murmured. You said you couldn't find the Valgness anyway, she said with equal quiet, tucking a loose strand of her hair, dyed red once more, back under her hood. Well, here are some lovely commanders and minions just waiting for you to track them home. Consider it Araman's form of apology. Because he knew that she would bring Kaol with her tonight. She'd guessed as much, debated not bringing the captain, but in the end, she needed him here, needed to be here herself, more than she needed to upend Araman's plans. Kaol sliced a glare in her direction, but then shifted his attention to the crowd around them, and said again, This is a terrible idea. She followed his stare toward Arabin, who stood across the sandy pit in which two men were fighting, now so bloodied up she couldn't tell who was in worse shape. He summons, I answer, just keep your eyes open. It was the most they'd said to each other all night, but she had other things to worry about. It had taken just one minute in this place to understand why Arabin had summoned her. The Val guards flocked to the pits, not to arrest and torture, but to watch. They were interspersed among the crowd, hooded, smiling, cold as if the blood and rage fueled them. Beneath her black mask, Aelin focused on her breathing. Three days after his rescue, Aiden was still injured badly enough that he remained bedridden, one of Kael's most trusted rebels watching over the apartment. But she needed someone at her back tonight, so she'd ask Kael and Nezrin to come, 
even if she knew it would play into Arabin's plans. She'd tracked them down at a covert rebel meeting, to no one's delight, especially when, apparently, the Valg had vanished with their victims and couldn't be found despite days of tracking them. One look at Kael's pursed lips had told her exactly whose antics he thought were to blame for it. So she was glad to talk to Nezrin instead, if only to take her mind off the new task pressing on her. It's chiming now a mocking invitation from the glass castle, but destroying the clock tower, freeing magic, had to wait. At least she'd been right about Arabin wanting Kael here. The Valg clearly an offering meant to entice the captain to continue trusting and confiding in him. Aelin sensed Arabin's arrival at her side moments before his red hair slid into her peripheral vision. Any plans to wreck this establishment, too? A dark head appeared at his other side, along with the wide-eyed male stares that followed it everywhere. Aelin was grateful for the mask that hid the tightness in her face as Lysandra inclined her head in greeting. Aelin made a good show of looking Lysandra up and down and then turned to Arabin, dismissing the courtesan as if she were no more than a bit of ornamentation. I just cleaned the suit, Aelin drilled to Arabin, wrecking this shithole would only mess it up again. Arabin chuckled. In case you were wondering, a certain celebrated dancer was on a ship heading south with all of her dancers before word of your escapades even reached the docks. The roar of the crowd nearly drowned out his words. Lysander frowned at a reveler who nearly spilled his ale on the skirts of her mint and cream gown. Thank you, Aelin said, and meant it. She didn't bring up Arabin's little game of playing her and Kaol against each other. Not when that was precisely what he'd wanted. Arabin gave her a smile smug enough to make her ask, Is there a particular reason that my services are necessary here tonight, or is this another present of yours? After you so gleefully wrecked the vaults, I'm now in the market for a new investment. The owners of the pits, despite being public about wanting an investor, are hesitant to accept my offer. Participating tonight will go a long way toward convincing them of my considerable assets and what I might bring to the table and make a threat to the owners, to show off his deadly arsenal of assassins, and how they might help turn an even higher profit with fixed events against trained killers. She knew exactly what he would say next. Alas, my fighter fell through, Arabin went on. I needed a replacement. And who am I fighting as, exactly? I told the owners you were trained by the silent assassins of the Red Desert. You remember them, don't you? Give the pit lord whatever name you want. Prick. She'd never forget those months in the Red Desert, or who had sent her there. She jerked her chin at Lysandra. Aren't you a little fussy for this sort of place? And here I was thinking you and Lysandra had become friends after your dramatic rescue. Arabin, let's go watch somewhere else, Lysandra murmured, the fight's ending. She wondered what it was like to have to endure the man who had slaughtered your lover. But Lysandra's face was a mask of worried, wary mindlessness, another skin she wore as she idly cooled herself with a gorgeous fan of lace and ivory, so out of place in this cesspit. Pretty, isn't it? Arabin gave it to me, Lysandra said, noticing her attention. A small trinket for such a tremendously talented lady, Arabin said, leaning down to kiss Lysandra's bare neck. Aelin clamped down on her disgust so hard that she choked on it. Arabin sauntered off into the crowd like a snake through the grass, catching the eye of the willowy pit lord. When he was deep enough in the crowd, Aelin stepped closer to Lysandra, the courtesan glanced away from her, and Aelin knew it wasn't an act. So softly no one can hear, Aelin said, Thank you, for the other day. Lysandra kept her eyes on the crowd and the bloodied fighters around them. They landed on the Valg, and she quickly looked at Aelin again, shifting so that the crowd formed a wall between her and the demons across the pit. Is he all right? Yes, just resting and eating as much as he can, Aelin said. And now that Aiden was safe, she would soon have to begin fulfilling her little favor to Arabin. Though she doubted her former master had longed to live once Aiden recovered and found out what sort of danger Arabin was putting her in, let alone what he'd done to her throughout the years. Good, Lysandra said, the crowd keeping them cocooned. Arabin clapped the pit lord on the shoulder and stalked back toward them. Aelin tapped her foot until the king of assassins was between them again. Kael subtly moved with an earshot, a hand on his sword. Aelin just braced her hand on her hips. Who shall my opponent be? Arabin inclined his head toward the pack of the Valg guards. Whichever one of them you desire, I just hope you choose one in less time than it's taken you to decide which one you'll hand over to me. So that was what this was about. Who had the upper hand? And if she refused, with the debt unpaid, he could do worse. So much worse. You're insane, Kael said to Arabin, following his line of sight. So he speaks, Arabin purred. You're welcome, by the way, for the little tip. He flicked his gaze toward the gathered Valg. 
so they were a gift for the captain then. Kale glared. I don't need you to do my work. Stay out of it, Aelin snapped, hoping Kale would understand the ire wasn't for him. He turned back toward the blood-splattered sand, shaking his head. Let him be mad. She had plenty to rage at him for anyway. The crowd died down, and the pit lord called for the next fighter. You're up, Arabin said, smiling. Let's see what those things are capable of. Lysandra squeezed his arm, as if pleading for him to let it go. I would keep back, Aelin said to her, cracking her neck. You wouldn't want to get blood on that pretty dress. Arabin chuckled. Put on a good show, would you? I want the owners impressed and pissing themselves. Oh, she would put on a show. After days cooped up in the apartment at Aiden's side, she had energy to spare. And she didn't mind spilling some Valg blood. She shoved through the crowd, not daring to draw more attention to Kaol by saying goodbye. People took one look at her and backed away. With the suit, the boots, and the mask, she knew she was death incarnate. Aelin dropped into a swagger, her hips shifting with each step, rolling her shoulders as if loosening them. The crowd grew louder, restless. She sidled up to the willowy pit lord, who looked her over and said, No weapons. She merely cocked her head and lifted her arms, turning in a circle and even allowed the pit lord's little minion to pat her down with his sweaty hands to prove that she was unarmed, as far as they could tell. Name, the pit lord demanded. Around her, gold was already flashing. Ansel of Briarcliff, she said, the mask distorting her voice to a gravelly rasp. Opponent? Aelin looked across the pit to the crowd gathered and pointed. Him. The Valg commander was already grinning at her. Chapter 24 Kaol didn't know what the hell to think as Aelin leaped into the pit, landing on her haunches, but the crowd had seen whom she pointed to and was already in a frenzy, shoving up to the front, passing gold as last-minute bets were made. He had to plant his heels to keep from being knocked over the open line of the pit. No ropes or railings here. If you fell in, you were fair game. A small part of him was glad Nezrin was on watch in the back, and a smaller part of him was glad for a night without more fruitless hunting for the new Valgness even if it meant dealing with Aelin for a few hours, even if Arab and Hamill had been giving him this little gift, a gift that, he hated to admit, he sorely needed and did appreciate. But that was no doubt how Arabin operated. Kael wondered what the price would be, or whether his fear of a potential price was payment enough for the King of the Assassins. Dressed head to toe in black, Aelin was a living shadow, pacing like a jungle cat on her side of the pit as the Valg commander jumped in. He could have sworn the ground shuddered. They were both insane, Aelin and her master. Arabin had said to choose any one of the Valg. She picked their leader. They'd barely spoken since their fight after Aiden's rescue. Frankly, she didn't deserve a word out of him, but when she'd hunted him down an hour ago, interrupting a meeting that was so secret that they disclosed the location to the rebel leaders only an hour before, maybe he was a fool, but he couldn't in good conscience say no, if only because Aiden would have slaughtered him for it. But since the Valg were here, Yes, this night had been useful after all. The pit lord began shouting the rules. Simply, there were none, save for no blades, just hands and feet and wits. Gods above. Aelin stilled her pacing, and Kael had to elbow an overeager man in the stomach to keep from being shoved into the pit. The queen of Terrison was in a fighting pit in the slums of Rifthold. No one here, he'd wager, would believe it. He was hardly able to believe it himself. The pit lord roared for the match to begin, and then they moved. The commander lunged with the punch so swift most men would have their heads spun around, but Aelin dodged and caught his arm in one hand, locking it into a hold he knew was bone-snapping. As the commander's face twisted with pain, she drove her knee up into the side of his head. It was so fast, so brutal, even the crowd didn't know what the hell had happened until the commander was staggering back and Aelin was dancing on her toes. The commander laughed, straightening. It was the only break Aelin gave him before she went on the offensive. She moved like midnight storm. Whatever training she'd had in Wendelin, whatever that prince had taught her, gods helped them all. Punch after punch, block, lunge, duck, spin, the crowd was a writhing thing, foaming at the mouth at the swiftness, the skill. Kale had seen her kill. It had been a while since he'd seen her fight for the enjoyment of it, and she was enjoying the hell out of this. An opponent worthy of her, he supposed, as she locked her legs around the commander's head and rolled, flipping him. Sand sprayed around them. She wound up on top, driving her fist down into the man's cold, handsome face, only to be hurled off with a twist so swift that Kale could hardly follow the movement. Aelin hit the bloodied sand and uncoiled to her feet just as the commander attacked once more. 
Then they were again a blur of limbs and blows and darkness. Across the pit, Arabin was wide-eyed, grinning, a starving man before a feast. Lysander clung to his side, her knuckles white as she gripped his arm. Men were whispering in Arabin's ear, their eyes locked on the pit, as hungry as Arabin. Either the owners of the pits or prospective clients bargaining for the use of the woman fighting with such wild wrath and wicked delight. Aelin landed a kick to the commander's stomach that sent him slamming into the rock wall. He slumped, grasping for air. The crowd cheered, and Aelin flung out her arms, turning in a slow circle, death triumphant. The crowd's answering roar made Kaol wonder if the ceiling would come crashing down. The commander hurtled for her, and Aelin whirled, catching him and locking his arms and neck into a hold not easily broken. She looked at Arobin, as if in question. Her master glanced at the wide-eyed ravenous men beside him, then nodded to her. Kaol's stomach turned over. Arobin had seen enough, proved enough. It hadn't even been a fair fight. Aelin had let it go on because Arobin had wanted it to go on, and once she took out that clock tower and her magic was back, what checks would there be against her? Against Aiden and that fey prince of hers, and all the warriors like them. A new world, yes, but a world in which the ordinary human voice would be nothing more than a whisper. Aelin twisted in the commander's arms, and the demon shrieked in pain, and then... Then Aelin was staggering back, clutching at her forearm, at the blood shining bright through the shred of her suit. It was only when the commander whirled, blood slipping down his chin, his eyes pitch black, that Kael understood. He'd bitten her. Kael hissed through his teeth. The commander licked his lips, his bloody grin growing. Even with the crowd, Kael could hear the Valg demon say, I know what you are now, you half-breed bitch. Aelin lowered the hand she'd clamped on her arm, blood shining on her dark glove. Good thing I know what you are too, prick. End it. She had to end it now. What's your name? She said, circling the demon commander. The demon inside the man's body chuckled. You cannot pronounce it in your human tongue. The voice skittered down Kael's veins, icing them. So condescending for a mere grunt, she crooned. I should bring you down to Morath myself, half-breed, and see how much you talk then. See what you make of all the delicious things we do to your kind. Morath. Duke Parrington's keep. Kale's stomach turned leaden. That was where they brought the prisoners who weren't executed, the ones who vanished in the night, to do the gods knew what with them. Aelin didn't give him time to say anything more, and Kael again wished he could see her face, if only to know what the hell was going on in her head as she tackled the commander. She slammed his considerable weight into the sand and grabbed his head. Crack! went the commander's neck. Her hands lingering on either side of the demon's face, Aelin stared at the empty eyes, at the open mouth. The crowd screamed in triumph. Aelin panted, her shoulders hunched, and then she straightened, brushing the sand off the knees of her suit. She gazed up at the pit lord. Call it. The man blanched. Victory is yours. She didn't bother looking up again as she knocked her boot against the stone wall, freeing a thin, horrible blade. Kaol was grateful for the screams of the crowd as she stomped it down through the neck of the commander, again, again. In the dim lighting, no one else could tell the stain in the sand wasn't the right color. No one but the stone-faced demons gathered around them, marking Aelin, watching each movement of her leg as she severed the commander's head from his body and then left it in the sand. Aelin's arms were trembling as she took Arabin's hand and was hauled out of the pit. Her master crushed her fingers in lethal grip, pulling her close in what anyone else would have thought was an embrace. That's twice now, darling, you haven't delivered. I said unconscious. Bloodlust got the better of me, it seems. She eased back, her left arm aching from the vicious bite the thing had given her. Bastard. She could almost feel its blood seeping through the thick leather of her boot, feel the weight of the gore clinging onto the toe. I expect results, Ansel, and soon. Don't worry, master. Kaol was making his way toward a darkened corner, Nezrin a shadow behind him, no doubt readying to track the Valg once they left. You'll get what's owed to you. Aelin looked toward Lysandra whose attention wasn't on the corpse being hauled out of the pit by the grunts, but fixed, with predatory focus, on the other Valg guards sneaking out. Aelin cleared her throat, and Lysander blinked, her expression smoothing into unease and repulsion. Aelin made to slip out, but Arabin said, Aren't you the least bit curious where we buried Sam? He'd known the words would register like a blow. He'd had the upper hand, the sure kill shot, the entire time. Even Lysander recoiled a bit. Aelin slowly turned. Is there a price for learning that information? A flick of his attention to the pit. You just paid it. I wouldn't put it past you to give me a fake location and have me bring stones to the wrong grave. 
not flowers, never flowers in Terrason. Instead, they carried small stones to graves to mark their visits, to tell the dead that they still remembered. Stones were eternal, flowers were not. You wound me with such accusations, Arabin's elegant face told another story. He closed the distance between them and said so quietly that Lysandra couldn't hear. Do you think you will not have to pay up at some point? She bared her teeth. Is that a threat? It is a suggestion, he said smoothly, that you remember what my considerable influences are and what I might have to offer you and yours during a time when you are so desperate for so many things. Money, fighters, a glance at the vanishing captain and Nezrin. Things your friends need, too. For a price. Always for a price. Just tell me where you buried Sam and let me leave. I need to clean my shoes. He smiled, satisfied that he'd won, and she'd accepted his little offering. No doubt soon to make another bargain, and then another, for whatever she needed from him. He named the location, a small graveyard by the river's edge, not in the crypts of the Assassin's Keep, where most of them were entombed. Likely meant as an insult to Sam not realizing Sam wouldn't have wanted to be buried in the keep anyway. Still, she choked out. Thank you. And then she made herself look at Lysandra and drawl. I hope he's paying you enough. Lysandra's attention, however, was on the long scar marring Arabin's neck, the scar Wesley had left. But Arabin was too busy smiling at Aelin to notice. We'll be seeing each other again soon, he said. Another threat. Hopefully when you've upheld your end of the bargain. The hard-faced men who had been at Arabin's side during the fight still lingered several feet away. The owners of the pits. They gave her a slight nod that she didn't return. Tell your new partners I'm officially retired, she said by way of farewell. It was an effort of will to leave Lysander with him in that hellhole. She could feel the Volk sentries monitoring her, feel their indecision and malice, and hope that Kale and Nezrin didn't run into trouble as she vanished into the open, cool night air. She hadn't asked them to come just to watch her back, but to make them realize precisely how stupid they'd been in trusting a man like Arabin Hamill, even if Arabin's gift was the real reason they were now able to track the Valg back to wherever they were squatting. She just hoped that despite her former master's gift, they at least understood that she should have killed Dorian that day. Chapter 25 Elide was washing dishes, carefully listening to the cook complain about the next scheduled shipment of supplies. A few wagons would arrive in two weeks, it seemed, carrying wine and vegetables and perhaps, if they were lucky, salted meat. Yet it wasn't what was coming that interested her, but how it was carried, what sort of wagons might bear it, and where a lead might best hide in one. That was when one of the witches walked in. Not Manon, but the one named Astring, golden-haired with eyes like star-flecked night and a wildness in her every breath. Elid had long ago noted how quick she was to grin, and had marked the moments when Astrin thought no one was looking and gazed across the horizon, her face tight. Secrets. Astrin was a witch with secrets, and secrets made people deadly. Elid kept her head down, shoulders tucked in, as the kitchen quieted in the third's presence. Astrin just swaggered right up to the cook, who had gone pale as death. He was a loud, kind man most days, but a coward at heart. Lady Astrin, he said, and everyone, Elite included, bowed. The witch smiled, with white normal teeth, thank the gods. I was thinking I might help with the dishes. Elite's blood chilled. She felt the eyes of everyone in the kitchen fix on her. As much as we appreciate it, lady, are you rejecting my offer, mortal? Elite didn't dare turn around. Beneath the soapy water, her pruny hand shook. She fisted them. Fear was useless. Fear got you killed. N no of course, lady, we... And a lead will be glad for the help. And that was that. The clatter and chaos of the kitchen slowly resumed, but conversation remained hushed. They were all watching, waiting, either for a lead's blood to spill on the gray stones or to overhear anything juicy from the ever-smiling lips of Astrin Blackbeak. She felt each step the witch took toward her, unhurried but powerful. You wash, I'll dry, the sentinel said at her side. A lead peeked out from behind the curtain of her hair. Astrin's black and gold eyes glittered. Th thank you, she made herself stammer. The amusement in those immortal gray eyes grew. Not a good sign. But Elide continued her work, passing the witch the pots and plates. An interesting task for a lord's daughter, Astrin observed, quietly enough that no one in the bustling kitchen could hear. I'm happy to help. That chain says otherwise. Elide didn't falter with the washing, didn't let the pot in her hands slip an inch. Five minutes, and then she could murmur some explanation and run. No one else in this place is chained up like a slave. What makes you so dangerous, Elide Loken? Elide gave a little shrug. An interrogation. That's what this was. Manon had called her a spy. 
It seemed her sentinel had decided to assess what level of threat she posed. You know, men have always hated and feared our kind, Astrin went on. It's rare for them to catch us, to kill us, but when they do, oh, they delight in such horrible things. In the waste, they've made machines to break us apart. The fools never realized that all they needed to do to torture our kind, to make us beg, she glanced down at Elite's legs, was to chain us, keep us tied to the earth. I'm sorry to hear that. Two of the fowl pluckers had hooked their hair behind their ears in a futile attempt to overhear them, but Astrin knew how to keep her voice low. You're what? Fifteen? Sixteen? Eighteen? Small for your age. Astrin gave her a look that made Elite wonder if she could see through the homespun dress to the bandage she used to flatten her full breast into an unnoticeable chest. You must have been eight or nine when magic fell. Elite scrubbed at the pot. She'd finish it and go. Talking about magic around these people, so many of them eager to sell any bit of information to the dreadlords who ruled this place, it would earn her a trip to the gallows. The witchlings who were your age at the time, the sentinel went on, never even had a chance to fly. The power doesn't set in until they're first bleeding. At least, now they have wyverns. But it's not the same, is it? I wouldn't know. Astrin leaned in close, an iron skillet in her long, deadly hands. But your uncle does, doesn't he? Elid made herself smaller and bought herself a few more seconds of time as she pretended to consider. I don't understand. You've never heard the wind calling your name, Elid Loken? Never felt it tug at you? You've never listened to it and yearned to fly towards the horizon, to foreign lands? She'd spent most of her life locked in a tower, but there had been nights, wild storms. Elid managed to get the last bit of burnt food off the pot and rinsed it, handing it to the witch before wiping her hands on her apron. No, lady, I don't see why I would. Even if she did want to flee, wanted to run to the other end of the world and wash her hands of these people forever, but it had nothing to do with the whispering wind. Astrin's black eyes seemed to devour her whole. You would hear that wind, girl, she said with expert quiet, because anyone with iron teeth blood does. I'm surprised your mother never told you. It's passed on through the maternal line. Which blood? Iron teeth blood? In her veins? In her mother's lineage? It wasn't possible. Her blood flowed red. She had no iron teeth or nails. Her mother had been the same. If there was ancestry, it was so old that it had been forgotten, but... My mother died when I was a child, she said, turning away and nodding her farewell to the cook. She never told me anything. Pity, Astrin said. The servants all gawked at Elite as she limped out, their questioning eyes telling her enough. They hadn't heard. A small relief then. Gods. Oh, gods. Witch blood? Elide took the stairs up, each movement sending shooting pages through her leg. Was that why Vernon had kept her chained? To keep her from flying off if she ever showed a lick of power? Was that why the windows in that tower in Pranth had been barred? No. No. She was human. Fully human. But at the very moment these witches had gathered, when she'd heard rumors about the demons who wanted to... to... breed, Vernon had brought her here and had become very, very close with Duke Parrington. She prayed to Aneath with every step upward, prayed to the Lady of Wise Things that she was wrong, that the third was wrong. It wasn't until she reached the foot of the wing leader's tower that Elid realized she had no idea where she was going. She had nowhere to go at all, no one to run to. The delivery wagons wouldn't arrive for another few weeks. Vernon could hand her over whenever he wished. Why hadn't he done so immediately? What was he waiting for? to see if the first of the experiments worked before offering her as a bargaining chip for more power? If she was such a valuable commodity, she'd have to go farther than she suspected to escape Vernon, not just to the southern continent, but beyond, to lands she'd never heard of. But with no money, how would she? No money except for the bags of coins the wing leader left scattered around her room. She peered up at the stairs, stretching into the gloom. Maybe she could use the money to bribe someone, a guard, a lower coven witch, to get her out, immediately. Her ankle barked in pain as she hurried up the stairs. She wouldn't take an entire bag, but rather a few coins from each, so the wing leader wouldn't notice. Mercifully, the witch's room was empty, and the various bags of coins had been left out with a carelessness only an immortal witch more interested in bloodshed could achieve. Elite carefully set about stuffing coins into her pocket, the binding around her breasts, and her shoe so she wouldn't be discovered all at once, so they wouldn't jingle. Are you out of your mind? Elite froze. Astrin was leaning against the wall, her arms crossed. 
The third was smiling, each of those razor-sharp iron teeth glinting in the afternoon light. Bold, mad little thing, the witch said, circling the lead. Not as docile as you pretend, eh? Oh, gods. To steal from our wing leader. Please, a lead whispered, begging. Maybe that would work. Please, I need to leave this place. Why? A glance at the pouch of money clenched in the lead's hands. I heard what they're doing with the yellow legs. My uncle, if I have... If I have your blood, I can't let him use me like that. Running away because of Vernon. At least we know you're not his spy, witchling. The witch grinned, and it was almost as terrifying as one of Manon's smiles. That was why she'd ambushed her with the knowledge, to see where Elide would run after. Don't call me that, she breathed. Is it so bad to be a witch? Astrin spread her fingers, appreciating her iron nails in the dim light. I'm not a witch. What are you then? Nothing. I'm nobody. I'm nothing. The witch clicked her tongue. Everybody is something. Even the most common witch has her coven. But who has your back, Elid Loken? No one. Only Aneath? And Elid sometimes thought even that could be her imagination. There is no such thing as a witch being alone. I'm not a witch, she said again. And once she got away, once she left this festering empire, she'd be no one at all. No, she's certainly not a witch, Manon snapped from the doorway. Gold eyes cold. Start talking now. Manon had endured a fairly shitty day, which was saying something given her century of existence. The Yellow Legs Coven had been implanted in a subterranean chamber of the keep, the room carved from the mountain rock itself. Manon had taken one sniff of that bed-lined room and walked right back out again. The yellow legs didn't want her there anyway, while they were cut open by men, while that bit of stone was sewn inside them. No, a black beak had no place in a room where yellow legs were vulnerable, and she'd likely make them as vicious and lethal as a result. So she'd gone to training, where Sorrel had kicked her ass in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Then there had been not one, not two, but three different fights to break apart between the various covens, including the Blue Bloods, who were somehow excited about the Valg. They had gotten their noses broken by suggesting to a Blackbeak coven that it was their divine duty not just to go through with the implantation, but also to go so far as to physically mate with the Valg. Manon didn't blame her Blackbeaks for shutting down the talk, but she had to dole out equal punishment between the two groups. And then this, Astrin and Elide in her rooms, the girl wide-eyed and reeking of terror, her third seeming to try to convince the girl to join their ranks. Start talking now. Temper. She knew she should rein it in, but the room smelled like human fear, and this was her space. Astrin stepped in front of the girl. She's not a spy for Vernon, Manon. Manon did them the honor of listening as Astrin told her what had happened. When she finished, Manon crossed her arms. Elid was cowering by the bathing chamber, the bag of coins still gripped in her hands. Where does the line get drawn? Astrin said quietly. Manon flashed her teeth. Humans are for eating and running and bleeding, not helping. If she's got witch blood in her, it's a drop, not enough to make her our own. Manon stalked toward her third. You are one of the thirteen. You have duties and obligations, and yet this is how you spend your time? Astrin held her ground. You said to keep an eye on her, and I did. I got to the bottom of things. She's barely past being a witchling. You want Vernon Loken bringing her down to that chamber, or over to one of the other mountains? I don't give a shit what Vernon does with his human pets. But once the words were out, they tasted foul. I brought her here so you could know. You brought her here as a prize to win back your position. Elide was still trying her best to vanish through the wall. Manon snapped her fingers in the girl's direction. I am escorting you back to your room. Keep the money if you want. My third has an airy full of wyvern shit to clean out. Manon, Astrin began. Wing leader, Manon growled. When you've stopped acting like a simpering mortal, you may again address me as Manon. And yet you tolerate a wyvern who sniffs flowers and makes puppy eyes at this girl. Manon almost struck her, almost went for her throat, but the girl was watching, listening. So Manon grabbed a lead by the arm and yanked her towards the door. A lead kept her mouth shut as Manon led her down the stairs. She didn't ask how the wing leader knew where her room was. She wondered if Manon would kill her once they reached it. Wondered if she'd beg and grovel for mercy when the time came. But after a while, the witch said, If you try to bribe anyone here, they'll just turn you in. Save the money for when you run. Elide hid the shaking in her hands and nodded. 
The witch gave her a sidelong glance, her golden eyes shimmering in the torchlight. Where the hell would you have run to anyway? There's nothing within a hundred miles. The only way you would stand a chance is if you got on the... Manon snorted. The supply wagons. Elite's heart sank. Please, please don't tell Vernon. Don't you think if Vernon wanted to use you like that, he'd have done it already? Why make you play servant? I don't know. He likes games. He might be waiting for one of you to confirm what I am. Manon fell silent again, until they rounded a corner. Elite's stomach dropped down to her feet when she beheld who stood in front of her door, as if she'd summoned him by mere thought. Vernon was wearing his usual vibrant tunic, today a terracing green, and his brows rose at the sight of Manon and Elide. What are you doing here? Manon snapped, coming to a stop in front of Elide's door. Vernon smiled. Visiting my beloved niece, of course. Though Vernon was taller, Manon seemed to look down her nose at him, seemed bigger than him, as she kept her grip on Elide's arm and said, For what purpose? I was hoping to see how you two were getting along, her uncle purred. But he looked at the hand Manon had around Elide's wrist and the door beyond them. It seems I needn't have worried. It took Elide longer to catch it than Manon, who bared her teeth and said, I'm not in the habit of forcing my servants. Only slaughtering men like pigs, correct? Their deaths equate to their behavior in life. Manon replied with a kind of calm that made Elide wonder whether she should start running. Vernon let out a low laugh. He was so unlike her father who had been warm and handsome and broad-shouldered, a year past thirty when he was executed by the king. Her uncle had watched that execution and smiled, and then come to tell her all about it. Allying yourself with the witches, Vernon asked Elide, how ruthless of you. Elide lowered her eyes to the ground. There is nothing to ally against, uncle. Perhaps I kept you too sheltered all these years, if you believe that's so. Manon cocked her head. Say your peace and be gone. Careful, wing leader, Vernon said. You know precisely where your power ends. Manon shrugged. I also know precisely where to bite. Vernon grinned and bit at the air in front of him. His amusement honed itself into something ugly as he turned to a lead. I wanted to check on you. I know how hard today was. Her heart stopped. Had someone told him about the conversation in the kitchens? Had there been a spy in the tower just now? Why would it be hard for her, human? Manon's stare was as cold as iron. This date is always difficult for the Loken family, Vernon said. Cal Loken, my brother, was a traitor, you know. A rebel leader for a few months after Terrison was inherited by the king. But he was caught like the rest of them and put down. Difficult for us to curse his name and still miss him, isn't it, Elide? It hit her like a blow. How had she forgotten? She hadn't said the prayers, hadn't beseeched the gods to look after him. Her father's death day and she'd forgotten him, as surely as the world had forgotten her. Keeping her head down wasn't an act now, even with the wing leader's eyes on her. You're a useless worm, Vernon, Manon said. Go spew your nonsense elsewhere. Whatever would your grandmother say, Vernon mused, stuffing his hands into his pockets, about such behavior. Manon's growl chased after him as he sauntered down the hall. Manon flung open Elite's door, revealing a room barely big enough for a cot and a pile of clothes. She hadn't been permitted to bring any belongings, none of the keepsakes that Fanula had hidden all these years, the small doll her mother had brought back from a trip to the southern continent, her father's seal ring, her mother's ivory comb, the first gift Cal Loken had given Marion the laundress while courting her. Apparently, Marion the Iron Teeth Witch would have been a better name. Manon shut the door with a backward kick too small. The room was too small for two people, especially when one of them was ancient and dominated the space just by breathing. Elide slumped under the cot, if only to put more air between her and Manon. The wing leader stared at her for a long moment and then said, you can choose, witchling, blue or red. What? Does your blood run blue or red? You decide. If it runs blue, it turns out I have jurisdiction over you. Little shits like Vernon can't do as they will to my kind, not without my permission. If your blood runs red, well, I don't particularly care about humans, and seeing what Vernon does to you might be interesting. Why would you offer this? Manon gave her a half-smile, all iron teeth and no remorse. Because I can. What if my blood runs blue? Won't it confirm what Vernon suspects? Won't he act? A risk you'll have to take. He can try to act on it. 
and learn where it gets him. A trap, and a lead was the bait. Claim her heritage as a witch, and if Vernon took her to be implanted, Manon could have the grounds to kill him. She had a feeling Manon might hope for that. It was not just a risk, it was a suicidal, stupid risk, but better than nothing. The witches, who lowered their eyes for no man, until she could get away, perhaps she might learn a thing or two about what it was like to have fangs and claws, and how to use them. Blue, she whispered. My blood runs blue. Good choice, witchling, Manon said, and the word was a challenge and an order. She turned away, but glanced over her shoulder. Welcome to the Black Beaks. Witchling. Elide stared after her. She had likely just made the biggest mistake of her life, but it was strange. Strange, that feeling of belonging. Chapter 26 I'm not about to keel over dead, Aiden said to his cousin, his queen, as she helped him walk around the roof. This was their third rotation, the moon shimmering on the tiles beneath them. It was an effort to keep upright, not from the steady throb in his side, but from the fact that Aelin, Aelin, was beside him, an arm around his waist. A cool night breeze, laced with a plume of smoke on the horizon, wrapped around him, chilling the sweat on his neck. But he angled his face away from the smoke, breathing in another better smell, and found the source of it frowning up at him. Aelin's exquisite scent soothed him, awakened him. He'd never get sick of that scent. It was a miracle. But her frown, that was not a miracle. What? he demanded. It had been a day since she'd fought in the pits, a day of more sleeping. Tonight, under the cover of darkness, was the first he'd been able to get out of bed. If he were cooped up for another moment, he'd start tearing down the walls. He'd had enough of cages and prisons. I'm making my professional assessment, she said, keeping pace beside him. As an assassin, queen, or pit brawler. Aelin gave him a grin, the sort that told him she was debating kicking his ass. Don't be jealous that you didn't get a shot at those Valg bastards. It wasn't that. She'd been fighting Valg last night, while he'd lain in bed, unaware that she was in any sort of danger at all. He'd tried to convince himself that despite the peril, despite how she'd returned reeking of blood and injured from where one of them had bitten her, she'd at least learned that Marath was where the people with magic were being turned into Valg vessels. Tried to convince himself, and failed. But he had to give her space. He wouldn't be an overbearing territorial fey bastard, as she liked to call them. And if I pass your assessment, Aiden said at last, will we go directly to Terrison, or are we waiting here for Prince Rowan? Prince Rowan, she said, rolling her eyes, you keep needling me for details about Prince Rowan. You befriended one of the greatest warriors in history, perhaps the greatest warrior alive. Your father and his men all told me stories about Prince Rowan. What? Oh, he'd been waiting to drop this particular gem of information. Warriors in the North still talk about him. Rowan's never been to this continent. She said it with such casualness. Rowan. She really had no clue who she now considered a member of her court, who she'd freed from his oath to Maeve, who she frequently referred to as a pain in her ass. Rowan was the most powerful, full-blooded fey male alive, and his scent was all over her, yet she had no god's damned idea. Rowan Whitethorn is a legend, and so is his... what do you call them? Cadre, she said glumly. The six of them, Aiden loosed a breath. We used to tell stories about them around fires, their battles and exploits and adventures. She sighed through her nose. Please, please don't ever tell him that. I'll never hear the end of it, and he'll use it in every argument we have. Honestly, Aiden didn't know what he would say to the male, because there were so many, many things to say. Expressing his admiration would be the easy part, but when it came to thanking him for what he'd done for Aelin this spring, or what exactly Rowan expected as a member of their court, if the Fey Prince expected to be offered the blood oath, then... It was an effort to keep from tightening his grip on Aelin. Wren already knew that the blood oath was Aiden's by right, and any other child of Terrison would know too. So first thing Aiden would do when the prince arrived was be to make sure he understood that little fact. It wasn't like in Wendelin, where warriors were offered the oath whenever their ruler pleased. No, since Brannon had found Terrison, its kings and queens had picked only one of their court to swear the blood oath, usually at their coronation or soon after. Just one for their entire lives. Aiden had no interest in yielding the honor, even to the legendary warrior prince. Anyway, Aelin said sharply as they rounded the corner of the roof again, we're not going to Terrison. Not yet. Not until you're well enough to travel hard and fast. Right now, we need to get the amulet of Orinth from Arabin. 
Aiden was half tempted to hunt down her former master and rip him to shreds as he interrogated him about where the amulet was kept, but he could play along with her plan. He was still weak enough that, until now, he'd barely been able to stand long enough to piss. Having Aelin help him the first time had been awkward enough that he couldn't even go until she started singing a body tune at the top of her lungs and turned on the sink faucet, all the while helping him stand over the toilet. Give me another day or two and I'll help you hunt down one of those demon pricks for him. Rage slammed into him as hard as any physical blow. The king of assassins had demanded she put herself in danger, as if her life, as if the fate of their kingdom were a god's damned game to him. But Aelin, Aelin had struck that bargain for him. Again, breathing became hard. How many scars would she add to that lethe, powerful body because of him? Then Aelin said, you're not going to hunt the Valg with me. Aiden stumbled a step. Oh, yes, I am. Uh, no, you're not, she said. One, you're too recognizable. Don't even start. She observed him for a long moment, as if assessing his every strength and weakness. At last, she said, very well. He almost sagged in relief. But after all that, the Valg, the amulet, Aiden pushed, will be free magic? A nod. I assume you have a plan. Another nod. He gritted his teeth. Do you care to share it? Soon, she said sweetly. Gods help him. And after completing your mysterious, wonderful plan, we'll go to Terrison. He didn't want to ask about Dorian. He'd seen the anguish on her face that day in the garden. But if she couldn't put the princeling down, he'd do it. He wouldn't enjoy it, and the captain might very well kill him in return, but to keep Terrison safe, he'd cut off Dorian's head. Aelin nodded. Yes, we'll go, but you have only one lesion. There are men who would fight, and other territories that might come if you call. We can discuss this later. He leashed his temper. We need to be in Terrison before the summer is out, before the snow starts falling in autumn, or else we'll wait until spring. She nodded distantly. Yesterday afternoon, she dispatched the letters Aiden had asked her to write to Wren, the Bane, and the remaining loyal lords of Terrison, letting them know they'd been reunited and that anyone with magic in their veins was to lie low. He knew the remaining lords, the old cunning bastards, wouldn't appreciate orders like that even from their queen, but he had to try. And, he added, because she really was going to shut him down about this, we'll need money for that army, she said quietly. I know. Not an answer. Aiden tried again. Even if men agree to fight on their honor alone, we stand a better chance of having greater numbers if we can pay them, not to mention feeding our forces and arming and supplying for them. For years now, he and the Bane had traversed from tavern to tavern, quietly raising funds for their own efforts. It still killed him to see the poorest of his people plunk hard-earned coins into the pans they'd passed around, to see the hope in their gaunt, scarred faces. The King of Adarlan emptied our royal coffers. It was one of the first things he did. The only money we have comes from whatever our people can donate, which isn't much, or whatever is granted by Adarlan. Another way of keeping control all these years, she'd murmured. Our people are beggared. They don't have two coppers to rub together these days, let alone pay taxes. I wouldn't raise taxes to pay for a war, she said sharply, and I'd rather not whore ourselves to foreign nations for loans either. Not yet, anyway. Aiden's throat tightened at the bitterness coating her tone as they both considered the other way money and men could be obtained. But he couldn't bring himself to mention selling her hand in marriage to a wealthy foreign kingdom. Not yet. So he just said, It's something to start contemplating. If magic is indeed freed, we could recruit the wielders to our side, offer them training, money, shelter. Imagine a soldier who can kill with blade and magic. It could turn the tide of battle. Shadows flickered in her eyes. Indeed. He weighed her posture, the clarity of her gaze, her tired face. Too much. She'd already faced and survived too much. He'd seen the scars, the tattoos that covered them, peeking over the collar of her shirt every now and then. He hadn't yet dared to ask to see them. The bandaged bite on her arm was nothing compared to that pain, and the many others she hadn't mentioned, the scars all over her, the scars all over both of them. And then, he said, clearing his throat, there's the blood oath. He'd had endless hours in bed to compile this list. She stiffened enough that Aiden quickly added, You don't have to, not yet, but when you're ready, I'm ready. You still want to swear it to me? Her voice was flat. Of course I do. He damned caution to hell and said, It was my right then and now. It can wait until we get to Terrison, but it's going to be me who takes it, no one else. Her throat bobbed. Right. A breathless answer that he couldn't read. She let go of him and stalked toward one of the little training areas to test out her injured arm. 
Or maybe she wanted to get away from him. Maybe he'd broached the topic the wrong way. He might have hobbled off the roof had the door not opened and the captain appeared. Aelin was already striding toward Kaol with predatory focus. He'd hate to be on the receiving end of that gate. What is it, she said. He'd hate to be on the receiving end of that greeting, too. Aiden limped for them as Kaol kicked the door shut behind him. The shadow market is gone. Aelin drew up short. What do you mean? The captain's face was tight and pale. The Valg soldiers. They went to the market tonight and sealed the exits with everyone inside. Then they burnt it. The people who tried to escape through the sewers found garrisons of soldiers waiting there, swords ready. That explained the smoke in the air, the plume on the horizon. Holy gods. The king had to have lost his mind entirely, had to have stopped caring what the general public thought. Aelin's arms slackened at her sides. Why? The slight tremor in her voice had Aiden's hackles rising, those fey instincts roaring to shut the captain up, to rip out his throat, to end this cause of her pain and fear. Because it got out that the rebels who freed him, Kale sent a cutting glance in Aiden's direction, were meeting in the shadow market to buy their supplies. Aiden reached her side, close enough now to see the tightness of the captain's face, the gauntness that hadn't been there weeks ago, the last time they'd spoken. And I suppose you blame me, Aelin said with a midnight softness. A muscle flickered in the captain's jaw. He didn't even nod a greeting to Aiden, or acknowledge the months they'd spent working together, what had happened in that tower room. The king could have ordered their slaughter by any means, Kaol said, the slender scar on his face stark in the moonlight. But he chose fire. Aelin went impossibly still. Aiden snarled. You're a prick for suggesting the attack was a message for her. Kaol at last turned his attention toward him. You think it's not true? Aelin cocked her head. You came all this way to fling accusations in my face? You told me to stop by tonight, Kale retorted, and Aiden was half tempted to punch his teeth down his throat for the tone he used. But I came to ask you why you haven't moved on the clock tower. How many more innocent people are going to be caught in the crossfire of this? It was an effort to keep his mouth shut. He didn't need to speak for Aelin, who said with flawless venom, Are you suggesting that I don't care? You risked everything, multiple lives, to get out one man. I think you find this city and its citizens to be expendable. Aelin hissed. Need I remind you, Captain, that you went to Endovier and did not blink at the slaves, at the mass graves. Need I remind you that I was starved and chained, and you let Duke Parrington force me to the ground at Dorian's feet while you did nothing. And now you have the nerve to accuse me of not caring, when many of the people in this city have profited off the blood and misery of the very people you ignored. Aiden stifled the snarl working its way up his throat. The captain had never said about the initial meeting with his queen, never said he hadn't stepped in while she was manhandled, humiliated. Had the captain even flinched at the scars on her back, or merely examined them as though they were some prize animal? You don't get to blame me, Aelin breathed. You don't get to blame me for the shadow market. This city still needs protecting, Kaol snaps. Aelin shrugged, heading for the roof door. Or maybe this city should burn, she murmured. A chill went down Aiden's spine, even though he knew she'd said it only to piss off the captain. Maybe the world should burn, she added, and stalked off the roof. Aiden turned to the captain. You want to pick a fight? You come to me, not her. The captain just shook his head and stared across the slums. Aiden followed his gaze, taking in the capital twinkling around them. He'd hated the city from the very first time he'd spotted the white walls, the glass castle, He'd been 19 and had bedded and reveled his way from one end of Rifthold to the other, trying to find something, anything, to explain why Darlin thought it was so God's damn superior, why Terrison had fallen to his knees before these people. And when Aiden had finished with the women and the parties, after Rifthold had dumped its riches at his feet and begged him for more, 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 he'd still hated it, even more than before. And all that time, and every time after, he'd had no idea that what he truly sought, what his shredded heart still dreamed of, was dwelling in a house of killers mere blocks away. At last, the captain said, You look more or less in one piece. Aiden gave him a wolf's grin, and you won't be if you speak to her that way again. Kale shook his head. Did you learn anything about Dorian while you were in the castle? You insult my queen, and yet you have the nerve to ask me for that information? Kale rubbed his brows with his thumb and forefinger. Please, just tell me, today has been bad enough. Why? I've been hunting the Valg commanders in the sewers since the fight in the pits. We tracked them to their new nest, thank the gods, but found no sign of humans being held prisoner. Yet more people have vanished than ever, right under our noses. 
Some of the other rebels want to abandon Rifthold, establish ourselves in other cities in anticipation of the Valk spreading. And you? I don't leave without Dorian. Aiden didn't have the heart to ask if that meant alive or dead. He sighed. He came to me in the dungeons, taunted me. There was no sign of the man inside him. He didn't even know who Sorsha was. And then, maybe because he was feeling particularly kind, thanks to the golden-haired blessing in the apartment beneath, Aiden said, I'm sorry, about Dorian. Kale's shoulders sagged as if an invisible weight pushed against them. A darling needs to have a future. So make yourself king. I'm not fit to be king. The self-loathing in those words made Aiden pity the captain himself. Plans. Aelin had plans for everything, it seemed. She had invited the captain over tonight, he realized, not to discuss anything with her, but the, for this very conversation. He wondered when she would start confiding in him. These things took time, he reminded himself. She was used to a lifetime of secrecy. Learning to depend on him would take a bit of adjustment. I can think of worse alternatives, Aiden said. Like Holland. And what will you and Aelin do about Holland? Kaol asked, gazing toward the smoke. Where do you draw the line? We don't kill children. Even ones who already show signs of corruption? You don't get the right to fling that sort of horseshit in our faces. Not when your king murdered our family. Our people. Kaol's eyes flickered. I'm sorry. Aiden shook his head. We're not enemies. You can trust us. Trust Aelin. No, I can't. Not anymore. Then it's your loss, Aiden said. Good luck. It was all he really had to offer the captain. Kale stormed out of the warehouse apartment and across the street to where Nezrin was leaning against a building, arms crossed. Beneath the shadows of her hood, her mouth quirked to the side. What happened? He continued down the street, his blood roaring in his veins. Nothing. What did they say? Nezrin kept up with him, meeting him step for step. None of your business, so drop it. Just because we work together doesn't mean you're entitled to know everything that goes on in my life. Nezrin stiffened almost imperceptibly, and part of Kale flinched, already yearning to take the words back. But it was true. He destroyed everything the day he fled the castle, and maybe he'd taken to hanging around with Nezrin because there was no one else who didn't look at him with pity in their eyes. Maybe it had been selfish of him to do it. Nezrin didn't bother with a goodbye before vanishing down an alley. At least he couldn't hate himself any more than he already did. Lying to Aiden about the blood oath was awful. She would tell him. She would find a way to tell him. When things were less new. When he stopped looking at her as though she were a god's damned miracle and not a lying cowardly piece of shit. Maybe the shadow market had been her fault. Crouched on a rooftop, Aelin shook off the cloak of guilt and temper that had been smothering her for hours and turned her attention to the alley below. Perfect. She'd tracked several different patrols tonight, noting which of the commanders wore black rings, which seemed more brutal than the others, which didn't even try to move like humans. The man, or was he a demon now? Hauling open a sewer grate in the street below was one of the milder ones. She'd wanted to shadow this commander to wherever he made his nest so she could at least give Kay all that information, prove to him how invested she was in the welfare of this piss-poor city. This commander's men had headed for the glowing glass palace, the thick river fog casting the entire hillside in greenish light. But he had veered away, going deeper into the slums, into the sewers beneath. She watched him disappear through the sewer grate, then nimbly climbed off the roof, hurrying for the closest entrance that would connect to his. Swallowing that old fear, she quietly entered the sewers a block or two down from where he climbed in, and listened carefully. Dripping water, the reek of refuse, the scurrying of rats, and splashing steps ahead, around the next big intersection of tunnels. Perfect. Aelin kept her blades concealed in her suit, not wanting them to rust in the sewer dampness. She clung to the shadows, her steps soundless, as she neared the crossroads and peered around the corner. Sure enough, the Valg commander was striding down the tunnel, his back to her, headed deeper into the system. When he was far enough ahead, she slipped around the corner, keeping to the darkness, avoiding the patches of light that shone through the overhead grates. Tunnel after tunnel, she trailed him, until he reached a massive pool. It was surrounded by crumbling walls covered in grime and moss, so ancient that she wondered if they'd been among the first built in Rifthold. But it wasn't the man kneeling before the pool, its waters fed by rivers snaking in from either direction, that made her breath catch and panic flood her veins. It was the creature that emerged from the water. Chapter 27 
The creature rose, its black stone body cutting through the water with hardly a ripple. The Valg commander knelt before it, head down, not moving a muscle as the horror uncoiled to its full height. Her heart leaped into a wild beat as she willed it to calm, and took in the details of the creature that now stood waist-deep in the pool, water dripping off its massive arms and elongated serpentine snout. She'd seen it before. One of the eight creatures carved into the clock tower itself. Eight gargoyles that she'd once sworn had watched her, smiled at her. Was there currently one missing from the clock tower, or had the statues been molded after this monstrosity? She willed strength into her knees. A faint blue light began pulsing from beneath her suit. Shit. The eye. Never a good side when it flared. Never, never, never. She put a hand over it, smothering the barely perceptible glow. Report. The thing hissed through a mouth of dark stone teeth. Word hound. That's what she would call it. Even if it didn't look remotely like a dog, she had the feeling the gargoyle thing could track and hunt as well as any canine, and obeyed its master well. The commander kept his head lowered. No sign of the general or those who helped him get away. We received word that he'd been spotted heading down the southern road riding with five others for Fenharrow. I sent two patrols after them. She could thank Arabin for that. Keep looking, the word hound said, the dim light glinting on the iridescent veins running through its obsidian skin. The general was injured. He can't have gotten far. The creature's voice stopped her cold. Not the voice of a demon or a man, but the king. She didn't want to know what sort of things he'd done in order to see through the thing's eyes, speak through its mouth. A shudder crawled down her spine as she backed down the tunnel. The water running beside the raised walkway was shallow enough that the creature couldn't possibly swim here, but she didn't dare breathe too loudly. Oh, she'd give Arab and his Val commander all right. Then she'd let Kaol and Nezrin hunt them all into extinction, but not until she had the chance to speak to one on her own. It took Aelin... Ten blocks to stop the shaking in her bones. Ten blocks to debate whether she would even tell them what she'd seen and what she had planned. But walking in the door and seeing Aiden pacing by the window was enough to set her on edge again. Would you look at that, she drawled, throwing back her hood. I am alive and unharmed. You said two hours. You were gone four. I had things to do. Things that only I can do. So to accomplish those things, I needed to go out. You're in no shape to be in the streets, especially if if there's danger. You swore there wasn't any danger. Do I look like an oracle? There's always danger. Always. That wasn't even the half of it. You reek of the god's damn sewers, Aiden snapped. Want to tell me what you were doing there? No, not really. Aiden rubbed at his face. Do you understand what it was like to sit on my ass while you were gone? You said two hours. What was I supposed to think? Aiden, she said as calmly as she could, and pulled off her filthy gloves before taking his broad, calloused hand. I get it. I do. What were you doing that was so important it couldn't wait a day or two? His eyes were wide, pleading. Scouting? You're good at this, aren't you? Half-truths. One, just because you're... you, it doesn't entitle you to information about everything I do. Two, there you go with the lists again. She squeezed his hand hard enough to shatter a lesser man's bones. If you don't like my lists, then don't pick fights with me. He stared at her. She stared right back. Unyielding. Unbreakable. They'd been cut from the same cloth. Aiden loosed a breath and looked at their joined hands, then opened his to examine her scarred palm, crisscrossed with the marks of her vow of Nehemia and the cut she'd made the moment she and Rowan became Karanam, their magic joining them in an eternal bond. It's hard not to think that all of your scars are my fault. Oh. Oh. It took her a breath or two, but she managed to cock her chin at a devious angle and say, Please, half of these scars I rightly deserved. She showed him a small scar down the inside of her forearm. See that one? A man in a tavern sliced me open with a bottle after I cheated him in a round of cards and tried to steal his money. A choked sound came from him. You don't believe me? <laughs> oh, I believed you. I didn't know you were so bad at cards that you had to resort to cheating. Aiden chuckled quietly, but the fear lingered. So she peeled back the collar of her tunic to reveal a thin necklace of scars. Baba Yellowlegs, matron of the Yellowlegs witch clan, gave me these when she tried to kill me. I cut her head off, then cut her corpse into little bits and shoved it into the oven in her wagon. I wondered who killed Yellowlegs. She could have embraced him for that sentence alone, for the lack of fear or disgust in those eyes. She walked to the buffet table and pulled a bottle of wine from inside the cabinet. I'm surprised you beast didn't drink all my good alcohol all these months. She frowned at the cabinet. Looks like one of you got into the brandy. 
Ren's grandfather, Aiden said, tracking her movements from his spot by the window. She opened the bottle of wine and didn't bother with a glass as she slumped to the couch and swigged. This one, she said, pointing to a jagged scar by her elbow. Aiden came around the couch to sit beside her. He took up nearly half of the damn thing. The pirate lord of Skull's Bay gave that to me after I trashed his entire city, freed his slaves, and looked damn good while doing it. Aiden took the bottle of wine and drank from it. Has anyone ever taught you humility? You didn't learn it, so why should I? Aiden laughed and then showed her his left hand. Several of the fingers were crooked. In the training camps, one of those Ardarlinian bastards broke every finger when I mouthed off. Then he broke them in a second place because I wouldn't stop swearing at him after. She whistled through her teeth, even as she marveled at the bravery, the defiance, even as pride for her cousin mingled with the slightest tinge of shame for herself. Aiden yanked up his shirt to reveal a muscled abdomen where a thick, jagged slash plunged from his ribs to his belly button. Battle near Rosamel. Six-inch serrated hunting knife curved on the tip. Running prick got me here. He pointed to the top, then dragged his finger down. And sliced south. Shit, she said. How the hell are you still breathing? Luck. And I was able to move as he dragged it down, keeping him from gutting me. At least I learned the value of shielding after that. So they went on through the evening and the night, passing the wine between them. One by one, they told the stories of the wounds accumulated in the years spent apart. And after a while, she peeled off her suit and turned to show him her back, to show him the scars and the tattoos she'd had etched over them. When she again reclined on the couch, Aiden showed her the scar across his left pectoral, from the first battle he'd fought, when he'd finally been able to win back the Sword of Orinth, her father's sword. He padded to what she now considered his room, and when he returned, he held the sword in his hands as he knelt. This belongs to you, he said hoarsely. Her swallow was loud in her ears. She folded Aiden's hands around the scabbard, even as her heart fractured at the sight of her father's blade, at what he had done to attain it, to save it. It belongs to you, Aiden. He didn't lower the blade. It was just for safekeeping. It belongs to you, she said again. There was no one else who deserves it. Not even her, she realized. Aiden took a shuddering breath and bowed his head. You're a sad drunk, she told him, and he laughed. Aiden set the sword on the table behind him and slumped back onto the couch. He was large enough that she was nearly popped off her own cushion, and she glared at him as she straightened. Don't break my couch, you hulking brute. Aiden ruffled her hair and stretched his long legs out before him. Ten years, and that's the treatment I get from my beloved cousin? She elbowed him in the ribs. Two more days passed and Aiden was going out of his mind, especially as Aelin kept sneaking out, only to return covered in filth and reeking to Hela's fiery realm. Going to the rooftop for fresh air wasn't the same as going out, and the apartment was small enough that he was starting to contemplate sleeping in the warehouse downstairs to have some sense of space. He always felt that way, though, whether in Rifthold or Orinth or at the finest of palaces, if he went too long without walking through forests or fields, without the kiss of the wind on his face gods above. He'd even take the Bane's war camp over this. It had been too long since he'd seen his men, laugh with them, listened to and secretly envied their stories about their families, their homes. But no longer. Not now that his own family had been returned to him. Not now that Aelin was home. Even if the walls of her home now pushed on him. He must have looked as caged as he felt because Aelin rolled her eyes when she came back into the apartment that afternoon. All right, all right, she said, throwing up her hands. I'd rather have you wreck yourself than destroy my furniture from boredom. You're worse than a dog. Aiden bared his teeth in a smile. I aim to impress. So they armed and cloaked themselves and made it two steps outside before he detected a female scent, like mint and some spice he couldn't identify, approaching them. Fast. He'd caught that scent before, but couldn't place it. Payne whipped his ribs as he reached for his dagger, but Aelin said, It's Nezrin, relax. Indeed, the approaching woman lifted a hand in greeting, though she was cloaked so thoroughly that Aiden could see nothing of the pretty face beneath. Aelin met her halfway down the block, moving with ease in that wicked suit of hers, and didn't bother waiting for Aiden as she said, Is something wrong? The woman's attention flicked from Aiden to his queen. He hadn't forgotten that day in the castle, the arrow she'd fired, and the one she'd pointed at him. No, I came to deliver the report on the new nests we found, but I can return later if you two are busy. We were just going out, Aelin said, to get the general a drink. Nezrin's shoulder-length night dark hair shifted beneath her hood as she cocked her head. You want an extra set of eyes watching your back? Aiden opened his mouth to say no, but Aelin looked contemplative. 
She glanced over her shoulder at him, and he knew she was assessing his condition to decide whether she might indeed want another sword among them. If Aelin were in the Bane, he might have tackled her right there. Aiden drawled to the young rebel. What I want is a pretty face that doesn't belong to my cousin. Looks like you'll do the trick. You're insufferable, Aelin said. And I hate to tell you, cousin, but the captain wouldn't be very pleased if you made a move on Felique. It's not like that, Nezrin said tightly. Aelin lifted a shoulder. It would make no difference to me if it was. The bare, honest truth. Nezrin shook her head. I wasn't considering you, but it's not like that. I think he's content to be miserable. The rebel waved a hand in dismissal. We could die any day, any hour. I don't see the point in brooding. Well, you're in luck, Nezrin Felique, Aelin said. Turns out I am as sick of my cousin as he is of me. We could use some new company. Aiden sketched a bow to the rebel, the motion making his ribs positively ache, and gestured to the street ahead. After you? Nezrin stared him down as though she could see exactly where his injury was groaning in agony, and then followed after the queen. Aelin took them to a truly disreputable tavern a few blocks away. With impressive swagger and menace, she kicked out a couple of thieves sitting at a table in the back. They took one look at her weapons, at that utterly wicked suit of hers, and decided they liked having their organs inside their bodies. The three of them stayed at the tap room until last call. Hooded so heavily they could hardly recognize one another, playing cards and refusing the many offers to join other players. They didn't have money to waste on real games, so for currency they used some dried beans that Aiden sweet-talked the harried survey girl into bringing them. Nezrin barely spoke as she won round after round, which Aiden supposed was good, given that he hadn't quite decided if he wanted to kill her for that arrow she'd fired. But Aelin asked her question about her family's bakery, about life for her parents on the southern continent, about her sister and her nieces and her nephews. When at last they'd left the drinking hall, none of them having dared to get inebriated in public, and none of them too eager to go to sleep just yet, they meandered through the alleys of the slums. Aiden savored every step of freedom. He'd been locked in that cell for weeks. It had hit an old wound, one he hadn't spoken about to Aelin or anyone else, though his highest-ranking warriors in the Bane knew, if only because they'd helped him exact his revenge years after the fact. Aiden was still brooding about it when they strode down a narrow, foggy alley, its dark stones silvered with the light of the moon peeking out above. He picked up the scrape of boots on stone before his companions did, his faint ears catching the sound, and threw out an arm in front of Aelin and Nezrin, who froze with expert silence. He sniffed the air, but the stranger was downwind, so he listened. Just one person, judging from the near-silent footfalls that pierced through the wall of fog, moving with the predator's ease that made Aiden's instincts rise to the forefront. Aiden palmed his fighting knives as the male scent hit him, unwashed but with a hint of pine and snow, and then he smelled Aelin on the stranger, the scent complex and layered, woven into the male himself. The male emerged from the fog, tall, maybe taller than Aiden himself if only by an inch, powerfully built and heavily armed both above and beneath his pale grey surcoat and hood. Aelin took a step forward, one step, as if in a daze. She loosed a shuddering breath and a small whimpering noise came out of her, a sob, and then she was sprinting down the alley, flying as the winds themselves pushed at her heels. She flung herself on the mail, crashing into him hard enough that anyone else might have gone rocking back into the stone wall. But the mail grabbed her to him, his massive arms wrapping around her tightly and lifting her up. Nezrin made to approach, but Aiden stopped her with a hand on her arm. Aelin was laughing as she cried, and the mail was just holding her, his hooded head buried in her neck, as if he were breathing her in. Who is that? Nezrin asked. Aiden smiled. Rowan. Chapter 28 she was shaking from head to toe and couldn't stop crying, not as the full weight of missing Rowan crashed into her, the weight of these weeks alone. How did you get here? How did you find me? Aelin withdrew far enough to study the harsh face shadowed by his hood, the tattoo peeking out along the side of it, and the grim line of his smile. He was here, he was here, he was here. You made it clear my kind wouldn't be welcome on your continent, he said. Even the sound of his voice was a balm and a blessing. So I stowed away on a ship. You mentioned a home in the slums, so when I arrived this evening, I wandered until I picked up your scent. He scanned her with the warrior's unflinching assessment, his mouth tight. You have a lot to tell me, he said, and she nodded. Everything. She wanted to tell him everything. She gripped him harder, savoring the corded muscle of his forearms, the eternal strength of him. He brushed back a loose strand of her hair, his calloused fingers scraping against her cheek in the lightest caress. The gentleness of it made her choke on another sob. But you're not hurt, he said softly. You're safe? She nodded again and buried her face in his chest. I thought I gave you an order to stay in Wendland. 
I had my reasons, best spoken about somewhere more secure, he said onto her hood. Your friends at the fortress say hello, by the way. I think they miss having an extra scullery maid, especially Luca, especially in the mornings. She laughed and squeezed him. He was here, and he wasn't something she'd made up, some wild dream she'd had, and why are you crying, he asked, trying to push her back far enough to read her face again. But she held on to him, so fiercely she could feel the weapons beneath his clothes. It would all be fine, even if it went to hell, so long as he was here with her. I'm crying, she sniffled, because you smell so running bad my eyes are watering. Rowan let out a roar of laughter that made the vermin in the alley go silent. She at last pulled away, flashing a grin. Bathing isn't an option for a stowaway, he said, releasing her only to flick her nose. She gave him a playful shove, but he glanced down the alley where Nezrin and Aiden were waiting. He'd likely been monitoring every move they made, and if he had deemed them a true threat to her safety, they'd have been dead minutes ago. Are you just going to make them stand there all night? Since when are you a stickler for manners? She slung an arm around his waist, unwilling to let go of him lest he turn into wind and vanish. His casual arm around her shoulders was a glorious solid weight as they approached the others. If Rowan fought Nezrin, or even Kaol, there'd be no contest. But Aiden? She hadn't seen him fight yet, and from the look her cousin was giving Rowan, despite all of his professed admiration, she wondered if Aiden was also wondering who'd emerge from that fight alive. Rowan stiffened a bit beneath her grip. Neither male broke their stare as they neared. Territorial nonsense. Aelin squeezed Rowan's side hard enough that he hissed and pinched her shoulders right back. Fey warriors, invaluable in a fight, and raging pains in her ass at all other times. Let's get inside, she said. Nezrin had retreated slightly to observe what was sure to be a battle of warrior arrogance for the ages. I'll see you later, the rebel said to none of them in particular, the corners of her mouth twitching upward before she headed off to the slums. Part of Aelin debated calling her back, the same part of her that had made her invite Nezrin along, the woman had seemed lonely, a bit adrift, but Felique had no reason to stay, not right now. Aiden fell into step in front of her and Rowan, silently leading the way back to the warehouse. Even through his layers of clothes and weapons, Rowan's muscles were tense beneath her fingers as he monitored Rifthold. She debated asking him what exactly he picked up with those heightened senses, what layers of the city she might never know existed. She didn't envy him his excellent sense of smell, not in the slums at least, but it wasn't the time or place to ask. Not until they got to safety, until she talked to him, alone. Rowan examined the warehouse without comment before stepping aside to let her go in front of him. She'd forgotten how beautifully he moved that powerful body of his, a storm-given flesh. Tugging him by the hand, she led him up the stairs and into the great room. She knew he had taken in every detail, every entrance and exit and method of escape by the time they were halfway across it. Aiden stood before the fireplace, hood still on, hands still within easy reach of his weapons. She said over her shoulder to her cousin as they passed, Aiden, meet Rowan. Rowan, meet Aiden. His highness needs a bath or I'll vomit if I have to sit next to him for more than a minute. She offered no other explanation before dragging Rowan into her bedroom and shutting the door behind them. Aelin leaned against the door as Rowan paused in the center of the bedroom, his face darkened by the shadows of his heavy gray hood. The space between them went taut, every inch of it crackling. She bit her bottom lip as she took him in. The familiar clothes, the assortment of wicked weapons, the immortal, preternatural stillness. His presence alone stole the air from the room, from her lungs. Take off your hood, he said with a soft growl, his eyes fixed on her mouth. She crossed her arms. You show me yours, I'll show you mine, prince. From tears to sass in a few minutes, I'm glad the month apart hasn't dimmed your usual good spirits. He yanked back his hood, and she started. Your hair! You cut it all off! She pulled off her own hood as she crossed the distance between them. Indeed, the long silver-white hair was now cropped short. It made him look younger, made his tattoo stand out more, and fine, it made him more handsome too. Or maybe that was just her missing him. Since you seem to think that we would be doing a good amount of fighting here, shorter hair is more useful. Though I can't say your hair might be considered the same. You might as well have dyed it blue. Hush, your hair was so pretty. I was hoping you'd let me braid it one day. I suppose I'll have to buy a pony instead. She cocked her head. When you shift, will your hawk form be plucked then? His nostrils flared, and she clamped her lips together to keep from laughing. He surveyed the room, the massive bed she hadn't bothered to make that morning, the marble fireplace adorned with trinkets and books, the open door to the giant closet. You weren't lying about your taste for luxury. Not all of us enjoy living in warrior squalor, she said, grabbing his hand again. She remembered these calluses, the strength and size of his hands, his fingers closed around hers. 
Though it was a face she'd memorized, a face that had haunted her dreams these past few weeks, it was new somehow, and he just looked at her as if he were thinking the same thing. He opened his mouth, but she pulled him into the bathroom, lighting a few candles by the sink and on the ledge of the tub. I meant it about the bath, she said, twisting the faucets and plugging the drain. You stink. Rowan watched as she bent to grab a towel from the small cabinet by the toilet. Tell me everything. She plucked up a green vial of bath salts and another of bath oil and dumped in a generous amount of each, turning the rushing water milky and opaque. I will when you're soaking in the tub and don't smell like a vagrant. If memory serves, you smelled even worse when we first met, and I didn't shove you into the nearest trough in Veress. She glared. Bunny. You made my eyes water for the entire damn journey to Mistward. Just get in. Chuckling, he obeyed. She shrugged off her own cloak, then began unstrapping her various weapons as she headed out of the bathroom. She might have taken longer than usual to remove her weapons, peel off her suit, and change into a loose white shirt and pants. By the time she finished, Rowan was in the bath, the water so clouded that she could see nothing of the lower body beneath. The powerful muscles of his scarred back shifted as he scrubbed out his face with his hands, then his neck, then his chest. His skin had deepened into a golden brown. He must have spent time outdoors these past weeks, without clothing, apparently. He splashed water on his face again, and she started into movement, reaching for the washcloth she'd set on the sink. Here, she said a bit hoarsely. He just dunked it in the milky water and attacked his face. The back of his neck, the strong column of his throat, the full tattoo down his left arm gleamed with the water sliding off of him. Gods, he took up the entire bathtub. She mutely handed him her favorite lavender-scented soap, which he sniffed at, sighed in resignation, and then began using. She took a seat on the curved lip of the tub and told him everything that had happened since they'd left. Well, mostly everything. He washed while she spoke, scrubbing himself down with brutal efficiency. He lifted the lavender soap to his hair and she squeaked. You don't use that in your hair, she hissed, jolting from her perch to reach for one of the many hair tonics lining the shelf above. Rose, lemon, verbena, or, she sniffed at the glass bottle, jasmine. She squinted down at him. He was staring at her, his green eyes full of the words he knew he didn't have to say. Do I look like I care what you pick? She clicked her tongue. Jasmine it is, you buzzard. He didn't object as she took up a place at the head of the tub and dumped some of the tonic into his short hair. The sweet, night-filled scent of jasmine floated up, caressing and kissing her. Even Rowan breathed it in as she scrubbed the tonic into his scalp. I could still probably braid this, she mused. Very teensy tiny braids, so... He growled, but leaned back against the tub, his eyes closed. You're no better than a house cat, she said, massaging his head. He let out a low noise in his throat that might very well have been a purr. Washing his hair was intimate, a privilege she doubted he'd ever allowed many people, something she'd never done for anyone else. But lines had always been blurred for them, and neither of them had particularly cared. He'd seen every bare inch of her several times, and she'd seen most of him. They'd shared a bed for months. On top of that, they were Karenam. He'd let her inside his power, past his inner barriers, to where half a thought from her could have shattered his mind. So washing his hair, touching him, it was an intimacy, but it was essential too. You still haven't said anything about your magic, she murmured, her fingers still working his scalp. He tensed. What about it? Fingers in his hair, she leaned down to peer at his face. I take it it's gone? How does it feel to be as powerless as a mortal? He opened his eyes to glare. It's not funny. Do I look like I'm laughing? I spent the first few days sick to my stomach and barely able to move. It was like having a blanket thrown over my senses. And now? And now I'm dealing with it. She poked him in the shoulder. It was like touching velvet-wrapped steel. Grumpy, grumpy. He gave a soft snarl of annoyance, and she pursed her lips to keep the smile in. She pushed down on his shoulders, beckoning him to dunk under the water. He obeyed, and when he emerged, she rose from the tiles and grabbed the towel she'd left on the sink. I'm going to find you some clothes. I have- Oh no. Those are going right to the laundress, and you'll get them back only if she can make them smell decent again. Until then, you'll wear whatever I give you. She handed him the towel, but didn't let go as his hand closed around it. You've become a tyrant, princess, he said. She rolled her eyes and released the towel, turning as he stood in a mighty movement, water sloshing everywhere. It was an effort not to peek over her shoulder. Don't you even dare, a voice hissed in her head. Right, she'd call that voice common sense, and she'd listen to it from now on. Striding into her closet, she went to the dresser in the back and knelt before the bottom drawer, opening it to reveal folded men's undershorts, shirts, and pants. For a moment, she stared at Sam's old clothes, 
breathing in the faint smell of him clinging to the fabric. She hadn't mustered the strength to go to his grave yet, but you don't have to give those to me, Rowan said from behind her. She started a bit and twisted in place to face him. He was so damn stealthy. Aelin tried not to look too jolted by the sight of him with the towel wrapped around his hips, at the tan and muscled body that gleamed with the oils of the bath, at the scars crisscrossing it like the stripes of a great cat. Even common sense was at a loss for words. Her mouth was a little dry as she said, Clean clothes are scarce in the house right now, and these are of no use sitting here. She pulled out her shirt and held it up. I hope it fits. Sam had been 18 when he died. Rowan was a warrior honed by three centuries of training in battle. She pulled out the undershorts and pants. I'll get you proper clothes tomorrow. I'm pretty sure you'll start a riot if the women in Rifthold see you walking down the streets in nothing but a towel. Rowan huffed a laugh and strode to the clothes hanging along one wall of the closet. Dresses, tunics, jackets, shirts. You wore all this? She nodded and uncoiled her feet. He flicked through some of the dresses and embroidered tunics. These are very beautiful, he admitted. I would have pegged you for a proud member of the anti-finery crowd. Clothes are weapons too, he said, pausing on a black velvet gown. Its tight sleeves in front were unadorned, the necklight skimming just beneath the collarbones, unremarkable save for the tendrils of embroidered shimmering gold creeping over the shoulders. Rowan angled the dress to look at the back, the true masterpiece. The gold embroidery continued from the shoulders, sweeping to form a serpentine dragon, its maw roaring toward the neck, the body curving down until the narrow tail formed the border of the lengthened train. Rowan loosed a breath. I like this one best. She fingered the solid black velvet sleeve. I saw it in a shop when I was 16 and bought it immediately, but when the dress was delivered a few weeks later, it seemed too... old. It overpowered the girl I was, so I never wore it, and it's hung here for three years. He ran a scarred finger down the golden spine of the dragon. You're not that girl anymore, he said softly. Someday I want to see you wear this. She dared to look up at him, her elbow brushing his forearm. I missed you. His mouth tightened. We weren't apart that long. Right. To an immortal, several weeks were nothing. So? Am I not allowed to miss you? I once told you that people you care about are weapons to be used against you. Missing me was a foolish distraction. You're a real charmer, you know that? She hadn't expected tears or emotion, but it would have been nice to know he'd missed her at least a fraction as badly as she had. She swallowed, her spine locking, and pushed Sam's clothes into his arms. You can get dressed in here. She left him in the closet and went right to the bathroom, where she splashed cold water on her face and neck. She returned to her bedroom to find him frowning. Well, the pants fit, barely. They were too short and did wonders for showing off his backside, but the shirt is too small, he said. I didn't want to rip it. He handed it to her, and she looked a bit helplessly at the shirt, then at his bare torso. I'll go out first thing, she sighed sharply through her nose. Well, if you don't mind meeting Aiden shirtless, I suppose we should go and say hello. We need to talk. Good talk or bad talk? The kind that will make me glad you don't have access to your power so you don't spew flames everywhere. Her stomach tightened, but she said, That was one incident, and if you ask me, your absolutely wonderful former lover deserved it more than deserved it. The encounter with the visiting group of highborn Fay at Mistward had been miserable, to say the least, and when Rowan's former lover had refused to stop touching him, despite his request to do so, when she'd threatened to have Aelin whipped for stepping in. Well, Aelin's new favorite nickname, Fire-Breathing Bitch Queen, had been fairly accurate during that dinner. A twitch of his lips, but shadows flickered in Rowan's eyes. Aelin sighed again and looked at the ceiling. Now or later? Later. It can wait a bit. She was half tempted to demand he tell her what it was, but she turned toward the door. Aiden rose from his seat at the kitchen table as Aelin and Rowan entered. Her cousin looked Rowan over with an appreciative eye and said, You never bothered to tell me how handsome your fairy prince is, Aelin. Aelin scowled. Aiden just jerked his chin at Rowan. Tomorrow morning, you and I are going to train on the roof. I want to know everything you know. Aelin clicked her tongue. All I've heard from your mouth these past few days is Prince Rowan this and Prince Rowan that, and yet this is what you decide to say to him? No bowing and scraping? Aiden slid back into his chair. If Prince Rowan wants formalities, I can grovel, but he doesn't look like someone who particularly cares. With a flicker of amusement in his green eyes, the fey prince said, Whatever my queen wants. Oh, please. Aiden caught the words, too. My queen. The two princes stared at each other. One gold and one silver, one her twin and one her soul bonded. 
There was nothing friendly in the stairs, nothing human. Two fey males locked in some unspoken dominance battle. She leaned against the sink. If you're going to have a pissing contest, can you at least do it on the roof? Rowan looked at her, brows high, but it was Aiden who said, She says we're no better than dogs, so I wouldn't be surprised if she actually believes we'd piss on her furniture. Rowan didn't smile, though, as he tilted his head to the side and sniffed. Aiden needs a bath, too, I know, she said. He insisted on smoking a pipe at the tath room. He said it gave him an air of dignity. Rowan's head was still angled as he said, Your mothers were cousins, Prince, but who sired you? Aiden lounged in his chair. Does it matter? Do you know? Rowan pressed. Aiden shrugged. She never told me, or anyone. I'm guessing you have some idea, Aelin asked. Rowan said, He doesn't look familiar to you? He looks like me. Yes, but, he sighed, you met his father a few weeks ago. Gavriel. Aiden stared at the shirtless warrior, wondering if he'd strained his injuries too much tonight and was now hallucinating. The prince's words sank in. Aiden just kept staring. A wicked tattoo in the old language stretched down the side of Rowan's face and along his neck, shoulder, and muscled arm. Most people would take one look at that tattoo and run in the other direction. Aiden had seen plenty of warriors in his day, but this male was a warrior. Law unto himself, just like Gavriel, or so the legends claimed. Gavriel, Rowan's friend, one of his cadre, whose other form was a mountain lion. He asked me, Aelin murmured. He asked me how old I was and he seemed relieved when I said nineteen. Nineteen was too young, apparently, to be Gavriel's daughter, though she looked so similar to the woman he'd once bedded. Aiden didn't remember his mother well. His last memories were of a gaunt, gray face as she sighed her final breath as she refused the fey healers who could have cured the wasting sickness in her. But he had heard she'd once looked almost identical to Aelin and her mother Evelyn. Aiden's voice was hoarse as he asked, The lion is my father? A nod from Rowan. Does he know? I bet seeing Aelin was the first time he'd wondered if he'd sired a child with your mother. He probably still doesn't have any idea, unless that prompted him to start looking. His mother had never told anyone, anyone but Evelyn, who his father was. Even when she was dying, she kept it to herself. She'd refused those fey healers because of it, because they might identify him. And if Gavriel knew he had a son, if Maeve knew, an old ache ripped through him. She'd kept him safe, had died to keep him out of Maeve's hands. Warm fingers slid around his hand and squeezed. He hadn't realized how cold he was. Aelin's eyes, their eyes, the eyes of their mothers, were soft open. This changes nothing, she said, about who you are, what you mean to me, nothing. But it did. It changed everything, explained everything. The strength, the speed, the senses, the lethal, predatory instincts he'd always struggled to keep in check. Why Roe had been so hard on him during his training. Because if Evelyn knew who his father was, then Roe certainly did too. And fey males, even half fey males, were deadly. Without the control Roe and his lords had drilled into him from an early age, without the focus, they'd known and kept it from him. Along with the fact that after he swore the blood oath to Aelin one day, he might very well remain young while she grew old and died. Aelin brushed her thumb against the back of his hand and then pivoted toward Rowan. What does this mean where Maeve is concerned? Gavriel is bound through the blood oath, so she would have a claim on his offspring? Like hell she does, Aiden said. If Maeve tried to claim him, he'd rip out her throat. His mother had died for fear of the Fae Queen. He knew it in his bones. Rowan said, I don't know. Even if she thought so, it would be an act of war to steal Aiden from you. This information doesn't leave this room, Aelin said, calm, calculating, already sorting through every plan. The other side of their fair coin. It's ultimately your choice, Aiden, whether to approach Gavriel. But we have enough enemies gathering around us as it is. I don't need to start a war with Maeve. But she would. She would go to war for him. He saw it in her eyes. It nearly knocked the breath from him, along with the thought of what the carnage would be like on both sides if the Dark Queen and the heir of Mala Firebringer collided. It stays with us, Aiden managed to say. He could feel Rowan assessing and weighing him and bit back a snarl. Slowly, Aiden lifted his gaze to meet the princes. The sheer dominance in that stare was like being hit in the face with a stone. Aiden held it. Like hell he'd back down, like hell he'd yield, and there would be a yielding, somewhere, at some point, probably when Aiden took the blood oath. Aelin clicked her tongue at Rowan. Stop doing that alpha male nonsense, once was enough. Rowan didn't so much as blink. I'm not doing anything. 
but the prince's mouth quirked into a smile, as if to say to Aiden, You think you can take me, cub? Aiden grinned. Any place, any time, prince. Aelin muttered, insufferable, and gave Rowan a playful shove in the arm. He didn't move an inch. Are you actually going to get into a pissing contest with every person we meet? Because if that's the case, then it'll take us an hour just to make it down one block of this city, and I doubt the residents will be particularly happy. Aiden fought the urge to take a deep breath as Rowan broke his stare to give their queen an incredulous look. She crossed her arms, waiting. It'll take time to adjust to a new dynamic, Rowan admitted. Not an apology, but from what Aelin had told him, Rowan didn't often bother with such things. She looked downright shocked by the small concession, actually. Aiden tried to lounge in his chair, but his muscles were taut, his blood thrumming in his veins. He found himself saying to the prince, Aelin never said anything about sending for you. Does she answer to you, general? A dangerous, quiet question. Aiden knew that when males like Rowan spoke softly, it usually meant violence and death were on their way. Aelin rolled her eyes. You know he didn't mean it that way, so don't pick a fight, you prick. Aiden stiffened. He could fight his own battles. If Aelin thought he needed protecting, if she thought Rowan was a superior warrior. Rowan said, I'm blood sworn to you, which means several things, one of which being that I don't particularly care for the questioning of others, even your cousin. The words echoed in his head, his heart, blood sworn. Aelin went pale. Aiden asked, what did he just say? Rowan had taken the blood oath to Aelin. His blood oath? Aelin squared her shoulders and said clearly, steadily, Rowan took the blood oath to me before I left Wendlin. The roaring sound went through him. You let him do what? Aelin exposed her scarred palms. As far as I knew, Aiden, you were loyally serving the king. As far as I knew, I was never going to see you again. You let him take the blood oath to you? Aiden bellowed. She had lied to his face that day on the roof. He had to get out, out of his skin, out of this apartment, out of this god's damn city. Aiden lunged for one of the porcelain figurines atop the hearth mantle, needing to shatter something just to get that roaring out of his system. She flung out a vicious finger, advancing on him. You break one thing, you shatter just one of my possessions, and I will shove the shards down your rotting throat. A command from a queen to her general. Aiden spat on the floor, but obeyed if only because ignoring that command might very well shatter something far more precious. He instead said, How dare you? How dare you let him take it? I dare because it is my blood oath to give away. I dare because you did not exist for me then. Even if neither of you had taken it yet, I would still give it to him because he is my Karanam and he has earned my unquestioning loyalty. Aiden went rigid. And what about our unquestioning loyalty? What have you done to earn that? What have you done to save our people since you've returned? Were you ever going to tell me about the blood oath? Or was that just another one of your many lies? Aelin snarled with an animalistic intensity that reminded him she, too, had fey blood in her veins. Go have your temper tantrum somewhere else. Don't come back until you can act like a human being, or half of one at least. Aiden swore at her, a filthy, foul curse that he immediately regretted. Rowan lunged for him, knocking back his chair hard enough to flip it over, but Aelin threw out a hand. The prince stood down. That easily, she leashed the mighty immortal warrior. Aiden laughed, the sound brittle and cold, and smiled at Rowan in a way that usually made men throw the first punch. But Rowan just set his chair upright, sat down, and leaned back as if he already knew where he'd strike Aiden's death blow. Aelin pointed at the door. Get the hell out, I don't want to see you again for a good while. The feeling was mutual. All of his plans, everything he'd worked for. Without the blood oath, he was just a general, just a landless prince of the Ash River line. Aiden stalked to the front door and flung it open so hard he almost ripped it off his hinges. Aelin didn't call after him. Chapter 29 Rowan Whitethorn debated for a good minute if it was worthwhile to hunt down the demi fay prince and tear him to bloody ribbons for what he'd called Aelin or if he was better off here with his queen, while she paced in front of her bedroom fireplace. He understood, he really did, why the general was enraged. He'd have felt the same, but it wasn't a good enough excuse, not even close. Perched on the edge of the plush mattress, he watched her move. Even without her magic, Aelin was a living wildfire, more so now with the red hair, a creature of such roaring emotions that he could sometimes only watch her and marvel, and her face, that god's damned face. 
While they'd been in Wendland, it had taken him a while to realize she was beautiful. Months, actually, to really notice it. And for these past few weeks, against his better judgment, he'd thought often about that face, especially that smart-ass mouth. But he hadn't remembered just how stunning she was until she'd taken off her hood earlier, and it struck him stupid. These weeks apart had been a brutal reminder of what life had been like until he had found her drunk and broken on that rooftop in Varese. The nightmares had started the very night she'd left, such relentless dreams that he'd nearly vomited when he'd flung himself out of them, Lyria's screaming ringing in his ears. The memory of it sent a cool licking down his spine, but even that was burned away by the queen before him. Aelin was well on her way to tearing a track in the rug before the fireplace. "'If that's any indication of what to expect from our court,' Rowan said at last, flexing his fingers in an attempt to dislodge the hollow shakiness he hadn't been able to master since his magic had been smothered, "'then we'll never have a dull moment.' She flung out a hand in a dismissal wave of irritation. "'Don't tease me right now.' She scrubbed at her face in half a breath. Rowan waited, knowing she was gathering the words, hating the pain and sorrow and guilt on every line of her body. He'd sell his soul to the dark god to never have to look at her like that again." Every time I turn around, she said, approaching the bed and leaning against the carved post, I feel like I'm one wrong move or word away from leading them to ruin. People's lives, your life, depend on me. There's no room for error. There it was, the weight that had been slowly crushing her. It killed him to have to add to it when he told her the news he carried, the reason he disobeyed her first order to him. He could offer her nothing but the truth. You will make mistakes. You will make decisions, and sometimes you will regret those choices. Sometimes there won't be a right choice, just the best of several bad options. I don't need to tell you that you can do this. You know you can. I wouldn't have sworn the oath to you if I didn't think you could. She slid onto the bed beside him, her scent caressing him. Jasmine and levin verbena and crackling embers. Elegant, feminine, and utterly wild. Warm and steadfast. Unbreakable, his queen. Save for the weakness they both shared that bond between them. For in his nightmares, he sometimes heard Maeve's voice over the crack of a whip, cunning and cold. Not for all the world, Aelin, but what about for Prince Rowan? He tried not to think about it, the fact that Aelin would hand over one of the word keys for him. He locked that knowledge up so tightly that it could escape only in his dreams, or when he woke reaching across a cold bed for a princess who was a thousand miles away. Aelin shook her head. It was so much easier being alone. I know, he said, clamping down on the instinct to sling his arm around her shoulders and tuck her in close. He focused on listening to the city around them instead. He could hear more than mortal ears, but the wind no longer sang its secrets to him. He no longer felt it tugging at him, and stuck in his fey body, unable to shift, caged, restless, made worse by the fact that he couldn't shield this apartment from any enemy attacks while they were here. Not powerless, he reminded himself. He had been bound head to toe in iron before and had still killed. He could keep this apartment secure, the old-fashioned way. He was just off balance at a time when being off balance could be fatal to her. For a while, he sat there in silence. I said some appalling things to him, she said. Don't worry about it, he said, unable to help the growl. He said some equally appalling things to you. Your tempers are evenly matched. She let out a breathy chuckle. Tell me about the fortress, what it was like when you went back to help rebuild. So he did, until he got to the knowledge he'd been holding in all night. Just say it, she said with a direct, unyielding sort of look. He wondered if she realized that for all she complained about his alpha nonsense, she was pure-blooded alpha herself. Rowan took a long breath. Lorcan's here. She straightened. That's why you came? Rowan nodded, and why keeping his distance was the smarter move. Lorcan was wicked and cunning enough to use their bond against them. I caught his scent sneaking around near Missward and tracked it to the coast, then on to a ship. I picked up his trail when I docked this evening. Her face was pale, and he added, I made sure to cover my tracks before hunting you down. Over five centuries old, Lorcan was the strongest male in the Fey realm, equal only to Rowan himself. They'd never been true friends, and after the events a few weeks ago, Rowan would have liked nothing more than to slit the male's throat for leaving Aelin to die at the hands of the Valg princes. He might very well get the chance to do that. Soon. He doesn't know you well enough to immediately pick up your scent, Rowan went on. I'd bet good money that he got on that boat just to drag me here so I'd lead him to you. But it was better than letting Lorcan find her while he remained in Wendland. 
Aelin swore with creative colorfulness. Maeve probably thinks we'll also lead him right to the third word key. Do you think she gave him the order to put us down, either to get the key or afterward? Maybe. The thought was enough to shoot icy rage through him. I won't let that happen. Her mouth quirked to the side. You think I could take him? If you had your magic, possibly. Irritation rippled in her eyes, enough so that he knew something else nagged at her. But without magic in your human form, you'd be dead before you could draw your sword. He's that good. He gave her a slow nod. She looked him over with an assassin's eye. Could you take him? It'd be so destructive I wouldn't risk it. You remember what I told you about Solomir? Her face tightened at the mention of the city he and Lorcan had obliterated at Maeve's request nearly two centuries ago. It was a stain that would forever linger, no matter what he told himself about how corrupt and evil its residents had been. Without our magic, it's hard to call who'd win. It would depend on who wanted it more. Lorcan, with his unending cold rage and a talent for killing gifted to him by Hellas himself, never allowed him to lose. Battles, riches, females, Lorcan always won at any cost. Once Rowan might have let him win, let Lorcan end him just to put a stop to his own miserable life, but now... Lorcan makes a move against you, and he dies. She didn't blink at the violence that laced every word. Another part of him, a part that had been knotted from the moment she left, uncoiled like some wild animal stretching out before a fire. Aelin cocked her head. Any idea where he'd hide? None. I'll start hunting him tomorrow. No, she said. Lorcan will easily find us without you hunting him. But if he expects me to lead him to the third key so he can bring it back to Maeve, then maybe... He could almost see the wheels turning in her head. She let out a hum. I'll think about that tomorrow. Do you think Maeve wants the key merely to keep me from using it, or to use it herself? You know the answer to that. Both, then, Aelin sighed. The question is, will she try to use us to hunt down the other two keys, or does she have another one of your cadre out searching for them now? Let's hope she hasn't sent anyone else. If Gavriel knew that Aiden is his son... She glanced toward the bedroom door, guilt and pain flickering on her lovely features. Would he follow Maeve, even if it meant hurting or killing Aiden in the process? Is her control over him that strong? It had been a shock earlier to realize whose son lounged at the kitchen table. Gavriel, he'd seen the warrior with lovers over the centuries, and seen him leave them at Maeve's order. He'd also seen him ink the names of his fallen men on his flesh. And of all his cadre, only Gavriel had stopped that night to help Aelin against the Valg. Don't answer now, Aelin cut in with a yawn. We should go to bed. Rowan had surveyed every inch of the apartment within moments of arriving, but he asked as casually as he could, Where should I sleep? She patted on the bed behind them. Just like old times. He clenched his jaw. He'd been bracing himself for this all night, for weeks now. It's not like the fortress, where no one thinks twice about it. And what if I want you to stay in here with me? He didn't allow those words to fully sink in. The idea of being in that bed. He'd worked too damn hard at shutting out those thoughts. Then I'll stay, on the couch. But you need to be clear to the others about what my staying in here means. There were so many lines that needed to be held. She was off limits, completely off limits, for about a dozen different reasons. He'd thought he would be able to deal with it, but... No, he would deal with it. He'd find a way to deal with it, because he wasn't a fool, and he had some goddamn self-control. Now that Lorcan was in Rifthold, tracking them, hunting for the word key, he had bigger things to worry about. She shrugged, irreverent as always. Then I'll issue a royal decree about my honorable intentions toward you over breakfast. Rowan snorted, though he didn't want to, he said. And the captain? What about him? She said too sharply. Just consider how he might interpret things. Why? She'd done an excellent job of not mentioning him at all. But there was enough anger, enough pain in that one word that Rowan couldn't back down. Tell me what happened. She didn't meet his eyes. He said what occurred here, to my friends, to him and Dorian, while I was away in Wendelin, that it was my fault, and that I was a monster. For a moment, a blinding, blistering wrath shot through him. It was instinct to lunge for her hand, to touch the face that remained downturned, but he held himself in check. She still didn't look at him as she said, Do you think? Never, he said. Never, Aelin. At last she met his stare, with eyes that were too cold, too sad, and too tired to be nineteen. It had been a mistake to ever call her a girl, and there were indeed moments when Rowan forgot how young she truly was. 
The woman before him shouldered burdens that would break the spine of someone three times her age. If you're a monster, I'm a monster, he said with a grin broad enough to show off his elongated canines. She let out a rough laugh, close enough that it warmed his face. Just sleep in the bed, she said. I don't feel like digging up bedding for the couch. Maybe it was the laugh or the silver lining her eyes, but he said, fine. Fool. He was such a stupid fool when it came to her. He made himself add, but it sends a message, Aelin. She lifted her brows in a way that usually meant fire was going to start flickering, but none came. Both of them were trapped in their bodies, stranded without magic. He'd adapt. He'd endure. Oh, she purred, and he braced himself for the tempest. And what message does it send? That I'm a whore? As if what I do in the privacy of my own room with my body is anyone's concern. You think I don't agree? His temper slipped its leash. No one else had ever been able to get under his skin so fast, so deep in the span of a few words. But things are different now, Aelin. You're a queen of the realm. We have to consider how it looks, what impact it might have on our relationships with people who find it to be improper. Explaining that it's for your safety. Oh, please, my safety? You think Lorcan or the king or whoever the hell else has it in for me is going to slither through the window in the middle of the night? I can protect myself, you know. God's above. I know you can. He'd never been in doubt of that. Her nostrils flared. This is one of the stupidest fights we've ever had, all thanks to your idiocy, I might add. She stalked toward the closet, her hips swishing as if to accentuate every word as she snapped, Just get in bed! He loosed a tight breath as she and those hips vanished into the closet. Boundaries. Lines. Off limits. Those were his new favorite words, he reminded himself as he grimaced at the silken sheets, even as the huff of her breath still touched his cheek. Aelin heard the bathroom door close, then running water as Rowan washed up with the toiletry she'd left out for him. Not a monster, not for what she'd done, not for her power, not when Rowan was there. She'd thank the gods every damn day for that small mercy of giving her a friend who was her match, her equal, and who would never look at her with horror in his eyes. No matter what happened, she'd always be grateful for that. But improper. Improper indeed. He didn't know how improper she could be. She opened up the top drawer of the oak dresser and slowly smiled. Rowan was in bed by the time she strutted toward the bathroom. She heard, rather than saw, him jolt upright, the mattress groaning as he barked. What in the hell is that? She kept going toward the bathroom, refusing to apologize or look down at the pink, delicate, very short lace nightgown. When she emerged, face washed and clean, Rowan was sitting up, arms crossed over his bare chest. You forgot the bottom part. She merely blew out the candles in the room one by one. His eyes tracked her the entire time. There is no bottom part, she said, flinging back the covers on her side. It's starting to get so hot, and I hate sweating when I sleep. Plus, you're practically a furnace, so it's either this or I sleep naked. You can sleep in the bathtub if you have a problem with it. His growl rattled the room. You've made your point. Hmm. She slid into the bed beside him, a healthy, proper distance away. For a few heartbeats, there was only the sound of rustling blankets as she nestled down. I need to fill in the ink a bit more in a few places, he said flatly. She could barely see his face in the dark. What? Your tattoo, he said, staring at the ceiling. There are a few spots I need to fill in at some point. Of course. He wasn't like other men, not even close. There was so little she could do to jar him, taunt him. A naked body was a naked body, especially hers. Fine, she said, turning so that her back was to him. They were silent again. Then Rowan said, I've never seen clothing like that. She rolled over. You mean to tell me the females in Doranel don't have scandalous night clothes? Or anywhere else in the world? His eyes gleamed like an animal's in the dark. She'd forgotten what it was like to be fae, to have one foot always in the forest. My encounters with other females usually didn't involve parading around in night clothes. And what clothes did they involve? Usually none at all. She clicked her tongue, shoving away the image. Having had the utter delight of meeting Ramel this spring, I have a hard time believing she didn't subject you to clothing parades. He turned his face toward the ceiling again. We're not talking about this. She chuckled. Aelin one, Rowan zero. She was still smiling when he asked, Are all your night clothes like that? So curious about my negligees, Prince. Whatever would the others say? Maybe you should issue a decree to clarify. 
he growled, and she grinned into her pillow. Yes, I have more, don't worry. If Lorcan is going to murder me in my sleep, I might as well look good. Vain until the bitter end. She pushed back against the thought of Lorcan, of what Maeve might want, and said, Is there a specific color you'd like me to wear? If I'm going to scandalize you, I should at least do it in something you like. You're a menace. She laughed again, feeling lighter than she had in weeks, despite the news Rowan had given her. She was fairly certain they were done talking for the night when his voice rumbled across the bed. Gold. Not yellow. Real. Metallic gold. You're out of luck, she said into her pillow. I would never own anything so ostentatious. She could almost feel him smiling at her as she fell asleep. Thirty minutes later, Rowan was still staring up at the ceiling, teeth gritted as he calmed the roaring in his veins that was steadily shredding through his self-control. That god's damned nightgown. Shit. He was in such deep, unending shit. Rowan was asleep, his massive body half-covered with blankets as dawn streamed in through the lace curtains. Silently rising, Aelin stuck out her tongue at him as she shrugged on her pale blue silk robe, tied her already fading red hair into a knot atop her head, and padded into the kitchen. Until the shadow market had burned to cinders, that miserable merchant there had been making a small fortune off all the bricks of dye she'd kept buying. Aelin winced at the thought of having to track down the vendor again. The woman had seemed the sort who would have escaped the flames, and would now charge double, triple, on her already overpriced dyes to make up for her lost goods. And since Lorcan could track her by scent alone, changing the color of her hair would have no impact on him. Though she supposed that with the king's guard on the lookout for her, oh, it was too damned early to be considering the giant pile of horse shit that had become her life. Groggy, she made tea mostly by muscle memory. She started on toast and prayed they had eggs left in the cooling box. They did. And bacon, to her delight. In this house, food tended to vanish as soon as it came in. One of the biggest pigs of all approached the kitchen on a mortal, silent feet. She braced herself as, arms full of food, she nudged the small cooling box shut with a hip. Aiden eyed her warily as she went to the small counter beside the stove and began pulling down bowls and utensils. There are mushrooms somewhere, he said. Good, then you can clean and cut them, and you get to chop the onion. Is that punishment for last night? She cracked the eggs one by one into a bowl. If that's what you think is an acceptable punishment, sure. And is making breakfast at this ungodly hour your self-imposed punishment? I'm making breakfast because I'm sick of you burning it and making the whole house smell. Aiden laughed quietly and came up beside her to begin slicing the onion. You stayed on the roof the whole time you were out, didn't you? She yanked an iron skillet from the rack over the stove, set it on a burner, and chucked a thick pad of butter onto its dark surface. You kicked me out of the apartment, not the warehouse, so I figured I might as well make myself useful and take watch. The twisty, bendy old ways manner of warping orders. She wondered what the old ways had to say about queenly propriety. She grabbed a wooden spoon and pushed the melting butter around a bit. We both have atrocious tempers. You know I didn't mean what I said about the loyalty thing, or about the half-human thing. You know none of that matters to me. Gavriel's son, holy gods, but she would keep her mouth shut about it until Aiden felt like broaching the subject. Aelin, I'm ashamed of what I said to you. Well, that makes two of us, so let's leave it at that. She whisked the eggs, keeping an eye on the butter. I, I understand, Aiden, I really do, about the blood oath. I knew what it meant to you. I made a mistake not telling you. I don't normally admit to that kind of thing, but I should have told you, and I'm sorry. He sniffed at the onions, his expert slicing leaving a neat heap of them on one end of the cutting board, and then started on the small brown mushrooms. That oath meant everything to me. Ren and I used to be at each other's throats because of it when we were children. His father hated me because I was the one favored to take it. She took the onions from him and chucked them into the butter, sizzling filled the kitchen. There's nothing that says you can't take the oath, you know. Maeve has several blood-sworn members in her court, who are now making Aelin's life a living hell. You can take it, and so can Ren, only if you want to, but I won't be upset if you don't want to. In Terrison, there was only one. She stirred the onions. Things change. New traditions for a new court. You can swear it right now if you wish. Aiden finished the mushrooms and set down the knife as he leaned against the counter. Not now. Not until I see you crowned. Not until we can be in front of a crowd, in front of the world. She dumped in the mushrooms. You're even more dramatic than I am. Aiden snorted. Hurry up with the eggs. I'm going to die of starvation. Make the bacon or you don't get to eat any. Aiden can hardly move fast enough. 
Chapter 30 There was a room deep below the stone castle that the demon lurking inside him liked to visit. The demon prince even let him out sometimes, through the eyes that might once have been his. It was a room cloaked in endless night, or maybe the darkness was from the demon. But they could see, they had always been able to see in the blackness, where the demon prince had come from, so little light existed that it had learned to hunt in the shadows. There were pedestals arranged in the round room in an elegant curve, each topped with a black pillow, and on each pillow sat a crown, kept down here like trophies, kept in the darkness, like him, a secret room. The prince stood in the center of it, surveying the crowns. The demon had taken control of the body completely. He'd let him. After that, women with the familiar eyes had failed to kill him. He waited for the demon to leave the room, but the demon prince spoke instead. A hissing, cold voice that came from between the stars, speaking to him, only to him. The crowns of the conquered nations, the demon prince said. More will be added soon. Perhaps the crowns of other worlds, too. He did not care. You should care. You will enjoy it as we rip the realms to shreds. He backed away, tried to retreat into a pocket of darkness where even the demon prince couldn't find him. The demon laughed. Spineless human, no wonder she lost her head. He tried to shut out the voice. Tried to. He wished that woman had killed him.